Is it? No, I mean, I've known this all along. And, uh, Jim has jumped out of this because he saw something. He said, hey, you know, these lights are great. I said, yeah, yeah. You know, he said, there's six or seven they can't work out that look like, that look like Greek. Now, if you read Julius Caesar's De Balicalico, it's not very, not very similar. If you read Ammianus Marcellinus, he says the Greek alphabet there. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not too far distant from the writers of the Dead Sea Scrolls, mm -hmm. is it? Mm -hmm. So I think the Dead Sea Scrolls are in Cumber. Well, maybe you better have a look at this. Uh, Nothing I can do about it. Mm -hmm. That's the, the inevitable result. You, know, you mm -hmm. say, oh, hell, I'm not fun mm -hmm. about it. Mm -hmm. And so it's not impossible that you know that you spend another three years just trying to get photographs off from idiots. I mean, I have to say, I know you've put work in college, I don't mean to be rude, but I've become very, uh, I'm not antagonistic, but I've got an antipathy towards universities, you know. Generally speaking, we do too. You know, I have, I have an antipathy, uh -huh. because the attitude generally is uh -huh. appalling. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, we have long said that it's, uh, and it's one of the major problems, and I'm, I'm sure it's that way in our country, they're, they're, uh, judging from our own university and others, you know, they're terribly credential, terribly, uh, terribly closed-minded, and and uh, have very few uh, few thoughts that aren't. Well, I think a lot of people talk to young people who are bright and on the way up, and and because they're young, they're talking to 20, 30 bright and challenging young minds in the class, but they're not educated minds, uh -huh. and you can convince yourself that you're very clever. Uh -huh. Well, actually, you're not clever than they are, they're just not up the way you are yet. Uh -huh. And I think there's a tendency for some people to think that they're, you know, cleverer than they are, and to see everybody else and anybody else as having nothing to say on this. Uh -huh. That's just an opinion, and I know it's not, uh, it doesn't apply to everybody, but it does apply. And I think, you know, do I do I want to get into this damn cave, and do I want to get into the Dead Sea Scrolls, and mm -hmm. or shouldn't I just get an agent to do what I've done, you know? Uh, I don't know. I think that really we want to try and sell what we've done. Now, I don't think I should go and authenticate this cave for nothing. Would you? Mm -hmm. Or would you? No. Let that go. Mm -hmm. See, Jim sees this as a crusade. You know? I'm not on a crusade. Um, I won't mind having something to film, right? Because it'd be fine. Okay. Right? Okay. okay. And if I feel that, if I feel that awkward about things, then I'm not going to have anything in that bloody woman. Right? Yeah. If anything happens to him, you know what happened to it. So, that's it. Uh, what do we do? Should we start? Yeah, what do you want me to say? What do you want me to say? What are we going to do first? Well, uh, I think we're just going to do the thing with Alan. Uh, a partnership. Right? And uh, if I if I die, the other the partner is still alive, possibly, right? Unless he dies before I do. So we've got to get that on tape that I'm one of a partnership, right? Okay. Do you want to name the name? Oh, the I'll name the partner. Yeah. He's well known in the books. So we work that way. But um, having said that, I think well, I'll tell you roughly what I've said about the importance of this alphabet because nothing works without it. It's the key to everything. How did you develop your work with the alphabet? How did I develop my work with it? Yeah, how did you get started working with the code? Well, the first thing we did was to prove that the history was largely correct. And then we said, well, if the history is largely correct, you know, and this is not a forged, false, fabricated history, then it's highly unlikely that the alphabet's forged and fabricated. If the history is true and correct, the alphabet's probably a perfectly true and, and correct and viable piece of history. Then it's fairly obvious that you have a mighty weapon in your hand, you have a tool. Because with the alphabet and its cipher, if you know which sign is A, which is CH, which is W, which is B, which is whatever, 
you then have a mighty weapon with which to unlock the past by reading the inscriptions. So the first thing to do obviously was to tackle the inscriptions in the UK. And once we'd done that and we had an idea that it, obviously it worked and, and that it was a correct alphabet with a correct cipher. In other words, it, 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 the definition of which letter of the modern alphabet matched the old symbol of the Colburn alphabet was producing words, coherent statements that were historically, you know, mostly verifiable. That you could tie them into history, to the area where they were, and to the date at which the stone apparently was set up with John Stone. You were straight into a historical context. So we then were able to say, well, if it works in Britain on uh, inscriptions, if this alphabet appears in other countries where we know our ancestral stories say it ought to be, then surely we've got a tie-up in, in that if our ancestors come from Phrygian Turkey, the Trojan area, and there are inscriptions in the same alphabet there, the same language would apply. If people went from Phrygian Turkey, Trojan area, to Etruria in Italy, and the same alphabet is there, then that should translate as well. In other words, all these people are speaking the same language. Now, once we got to, to that simple line of thought, it's merely about a matter of going back along the path. And the obvious analogy is that people came out of the United Kingdom, they went to Australia, New Zealand, Canada, South Africa, America, everywhere, and they took their English language from Britain, and they took the same alphabet with them. Because the people in New Zealand don't speak Maori and, and write in sign language, they speak English. And the people in America, they don't speak Algonquin or Sioux, and they don't write, you know, in weird scripts on sticks, they, they speak English. They write in the modern script. Therefore, that's what happened in antiquity. Does that make sense? Sure. All right. When do you want to start this? Any time. Okay. Well, we can stop if we want to. Any time. Any time. Any time. Start or stop. Okay, do you want to, do you want to, do you want to go? No. Right. Uh, my name's Alan Wilson, as you well know, and I operate with a partner, uh, Anthony Blackett, and we have set ourselves up in the field of history, for the study and pursuance of history, historical knowledge, and one of the uh, things we set up was a partnership, the MTP partnership. So I operate through the MTP partnership on equal terms with Blackett. Anthony Black is well known from the books which we jointly publish. Now, one of the major things that we've done in our studies is to delve things that we've done in our studies is to delve into the ancient history of the Brits. Now, in delving into ancient British history, we found a peculiarity. In modern times, it's been regarded as uh, a bogus history. And the reason for it being a bogus history comes out of Oxford and Cambridge and London in England. And the theory was that Troy never existed other than in the mind of Homer. And as Homer wrote a fictitious poem about Troy, Troy was a fictitious place. It had no foundation in fact or truth and was non-existent. Therefore, a history which based itself upon the first king of Britain being Brutus, the great grandson of Anchises and grandson of Aeneas of Troy, and that the whole of the British nation were originally, or a large part of them were originally Trojan, had to be a false history. As it was a false history based on Homer's fictional epic, therefore you throw out British history. And this actually was done. And you will find books by these supposed scholars from Oxford and elsewhere stating this in the words that I've just stated. That it's a bogus history based on a bogus fiction by Homer, that this is a brutal, a primitive race who had no real history of their own, a uh, bunch of savages, and they decided they would claim descent from Troy. Now, how this lunacy could have taken root in the 19th century is perhaps hard to understand. But you've got to realize that in the United Kingdom, it, 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 the word united doesn't really apply. It's a very fragmented, fratricidal place where all sorts of petty jealousies and, and major jealousies 
uh, consistently to the fore in the relations between the Scots, the Irish, and the Welsh, and the English. Everybody uh, seeks primacy and jealously attacks and, and niggles at the others. So what you start with in British history is a situation that the history is thoroughly derided before William the Conqueror. And this is the well-known phrase in Britain of, it all began in 1066. In other words, you couldn't believe anything that happened before 1066. Now this leads to a peculiar situation. You get modern professors, and I've read a book recently, I've read several, but one last year where a professor of archaeology uh, actually states we know nothing of British history whatsoever other than the snippets and small comments made by various Greek and Roman writers. Now that is uh, an inconceivably stupid statement. Uh, you could equally say we know nothing of what the Jews, or the history of the Jews, other than what Roman or Greek writers said about the Jews. In other words, you know nothing of the Jews. Now you know about the Jews because you know of the various histories and documents preserved by the Jews. The Bible, the Talmud, Flavius Josephus, and so on. And we don't say to the Jews, you have no history, because the Greeks and the Romans didn't mention you. And we don't go to China and say to the Chinese, you have no history, because the Greeks and Romans didn't write about you, nor do we do it to the Japanese. Each nation preserves its own history. And really, if you dig up uh, in ancient Assyria and you find the monuments of Assyria with their inscriptions and the libraries of various kings on cuneiform clay tablets, you are reading the self-preserved histories of Assyria, and the same in Chaldean Babylonia. So why Britain should be singled out and put into a bracket where we are told you cannot have original British records and British inscribed stones of antiquity, British coins and British artifacts, the whole archaeology of Britain and history of Britain, unless it's verified by some Roman or Greek who did not visit the country and who wrote, say, three to five hundred years after the events he's describing, very difficult to understand. So it's a, a, a double standard which has come in, and it's come in through petty political jealousies and political motivations in the United Kingdom. Now, what was happening when this Trojan uh, epic had to be abandoned in Britain was that it was in the early uh, 1800s, beginning of the 19th century. You just had the uh, American uh, Revolution, or War of Independence, tearing itself away from the Brits. Uh, on the British throne was a very unpopular German monarchy. George III was stark raving mad, although they tried to portray him otherwise. Uh, he had three, six uh, fat, debauched sons whose uh, performance around London with loose women and morganatic marriages and gross behavior was very unpopular. The uh, whole damn monarchy was in disrepute. The ruling elite, ruling class needed a puppet monarchy. They were still smarting under the uh, effect of the Jacobite rebellion where Bonnie Prince Charlie attempted to uh, oust these Hanoverians in the 1745-1750 era. The French had uh, risen on their hind legs and finally got rid of the aristocracy and they got rid of the king, and there were guillotines everywhere. And it was in this frantic environment in Britain that the decision was taken to get rid of past British history, because it was very necessary to create a bogus history and to eliminate anything that was a threat to the regime and the monarchy. And you've got to realize also that 50% of the British population are estimated to have supported the French Revolution, and at least 50%, if not more, were fully in support of the American Revolution. And uh, this probably is not realized outside the UK. So one of the targets was to abandon the ancient history of the country and to create a history that would shore up the monarchy and protect the establishment. So having gone into that in, in that way, uh, the detail can be researched by anybody. In particular, there was an assault upon the Welsh because it was in Wales that the histories were mainly preserved. The Welsh had been in their territories for 3,600 years, and they said very firmly, as did many of the Brits in England, that they were people of two migrations. One, a vast migration by sea from Syria, uh, about 1,600 years BC, coming from, presumably from Ur, from Diocletian, who turns out to be Dungi of Ur, 
and the second migration about 500 BC from a Trojan remnant in the western Asia Minor area, Phrygian Troja. And so we had two migrations, one 3,600 years ago, one 2,500 years ago, coming into the UK, bringing these influences from that area. Uh, these histories were forthwith abandoned purely on the basis that Troy never existed. Well, but 130 years after they abandoned the Albion legend, the coming of Albion from Syria, Leonard Woolley dug up uh, Ur of the Chaldees, and he dug up the royal necropolis. In digging up the royal necropolis, he dug up the vast tombs of the emperors of Ur. And one of them is of interest to us in that it's the greatest of the emperors who they think is of the third dynasty, named Dungi, who appears to be the British Diocletian. The interesting thing is that in the British record, written on manuscripts certainly a thousand years old, the idea was that Diocletian ruled 33 other nations. He also made his daughters rulers of nations or territories and he had a great enemy named Labana. When Woolley dug up Ur, he found the votive area of Diocletian, and he also found that Diocletian, or Dungi, ruled 33 other countries. He made some of his daughters rulers of countries, and he had a great enemy named Labana. Labana turns out to be the first king of the Hittites, emperor of the Hittites up in Anatolian Turkey, who did actually attack the Chaldean Euphrates civilization and recorded it. Every subsequent king of the Hittites took the throne name of Labana in the same way as the Caesars in Rome became Caesar after Julius Caesar. In other words, Caesar became a titular name as was a personal name. Everybody used it. Not until around 1880 was the Hittite uh, empire rediscovered, and so nobody in Europe would have known anything about Lavana. Yet the British knew all about Lavana a thousand years ago. About Lavana. Yet the British knew all about Lavana a thousand years ago. When Woolley dug up the votive area in the tomb of Dungi, he found metal tables. On the metal tables, he found that there were certain items: reclining models of rams, reclining models of bulls standing lambs, round balls. When they dug up the Lexton Mound in Cambridgeshire in England, said to be the tomb of King Kinvelin, or within the Le Lexton Mound, they found a metal table in the votive area, reclining bulls, reclining model rams, reclining and standing lambs, and round balls again. In other words, a complete identical panopanalia in the religious area. All these items are still in the Colchester Museum. But it seems not to occur to anybody to make the comparison. So there is some truth in the first legend, and you can take it further. You can compare the ancient uh, measurements, jurisprudence, uh, pottery. And in Britain, at the time of this invasion, 1600 BC, a marvelous metalworking culture burst out from nowhere. It had no antecedents, it had no precedence, there was no way that it could be traced back to a, a sort of development. It just came out of nowhere. And it's not unlikely that this metalworking culture known as the Wessex culture is a direct emanation of this invasion from Ur of the Chaldees. And if you begin to compare some of the marvelous gold and other bronze finds that they've made in ancient mounds and so on in Britain, if you make the comparison with ancient uh, Syrian Ur of the Chaldees, you will see that there is remarkable similarities. So you have an importing cult, imported uh, culture, an imported um, civilization, imported technology. In the same thing that's happened to the United States in the last 200 years, or more. Taking this a stage further, if there appears to be some basic truth in the Syrian migration, you also have mentions that are in the Odyssey, of, uh, said again to be by Homer, but I don't, where. Ulysses talks to a man who says that his homeland is a great ocean island in the Western Ocean beyond the pillars of Hercules, Gibraltar, which can only be Britain, and he calls it Syri. The name Syri still endures in Britain. It's Surrey, a large county on the south bank of the Thames, and London stands on most of it. 
Um, you have mentions in old documents, Karadak of Lancarvan describing people in the Midlands of England and speaking of the territories of the Ealda Sasenas in 1156. The old Syrians is pretty solid work. So the idea that the old Syrians came to Britain was well established and well remembered. In Ur, they were known as the Gutians, G-U-T-I-A-N-S. When Brutus came to Britain, the people who were recorded as being there were called Giantes, exactly the same name as the people who were found in the Canary Isles, Giantes. Later, they became the Gewissi, and in medieval manuscripts, Anglo-Saxon chronicles and so on, they're the Gewissi. And it's fairly clear that the Gutians, the Giantes, are the Gewissi. And later, they dropped the G-E and called them the Wissi, or Wessex people and said, ah, Wessex, West Saxons, isn't that beautiful? Complete misnomer and another part of the general political ploy to get rid of the history. They actually have translated the Giantes of Britain as being giants, as if there was a mythical giant race there, of great big people, and another attempt to create a myth out of fact. So, having dealt with them, we then thought it wise to possibly look at the Brutus legend. Now the Brutus legend is firmly embedded in Britain and you have to realize that the main line of kings of Britain always claims in history descent from Brutus and it doesn't matter if you could claim descent from the Holy Family or Jesus Christ or whatever, you have to be able to claim descent from Brutus to be king. There's no doubt about this. So Brutus had to be got rid of on the Trojan War being a uh, fiction and the city of Troy being a fiction, Brutus is a fiction. We decided that as the history was proving out in a number of other fields, we were getting all manner of evidence to prove it correct and reliable history and honorable history, honestly recorded in detail, that it was worth looking at the alphabet of the people. Now, in the same way as the Greeks have an alphabet, uh, the Arabs have an alphabet which is different and the Egyptians had a picture alphabet and the Chinese have a pictorial alphabet, hieroglyphics in Egypt. So we also have a peculiar alphabet peculiar to the British. You think it's peculiar to the British at first sight. Again, this alphabet has been thoroughly derided and they have called the alphabet a forgery, a fake and a fiction invented by a man named Edward Williams around 1800 difficult to see that because it's in a manuscript in the Bodleian Library in Oxford which dates around 1520. Difficult to see because it also uh, is mentioned in a book being written for and on behalf of the Prince of Wales in 1794 and the author states this alphabet I find in a very ancient manuscript in the Bodleian Library. Equally difficult as David Ap Willem um, probably the best of the Welsh poets, is describing the alphabet in his poems in 1370. Another poet, uh, Yoyan D, is describing the alphabet in 15, uh, no, 1425, roughly. And a further poet is describing the alphabet, in Gutter Glynn, in roughly 1450. Equally, it's well known that the alphabet was brought back into use to send messages on sticks around 1400, when Owen Glyndwr, the Welsh Prince, was fighting Henry IV of England. It goes on and on. There is a satirical poem in existence written by a man named Rhys Kine. And Rhys Kine was from Oswestry, and he went to an Eisteddfod in 1580, met a Welsh bard from Glamorgan who had a pipe in it. In other words, a frame of wood with wooden slats in it, upon which was cut with a knife the straight strokes of the Colburn alphabet and a story. And Rhys Kine kindly wrote a satirical mocking poem about the alphabet. Fine. We also find that in uh, 1946 at Nag Hammadi in Egypt, Chenoboskin it's called, a peasant named Muhammad Ali uh, was looking for firewood and he found a five foot clay jar, five foot tall, in an old cemetery. He dragged the jar out, took it home or broke it from one thing the other. Inside were 14 leather satchels. In the 14 leather satchels were 128 Gnostic books, a complete Gnostic library of the Gnostic Christian Church. Now for 1500 years, people have only really known about the Gnostics, what their enemies, the Church of Rome, chose to write about them, and it's not very polite. 
but here was an intact Gnostic library. Um, in amongst these 128 books is the book of Masanes, which means a flat, raw, and a wonder. It means an alphabet, it's not a name of a person. And this gives a complete detailed description of the Colburn British alphabet, how it is, what it is, and how it works. Same descriptions were published roughly, roughly the same, well, almost exactly the same in 1840 in Wales. So we have signs that the alphabet would work. Now, if we look at the Brutus legend, we have this. The British finally come from Western Turkey, Troy, to Britain under Brutus. They pick up people on the way. In other words, they stop at Spain, the Iberian Peninsula, pick up more of their countrymen from Troy and proceed to Britain. So you can possibly link a common alphabet in Britain, Iberic Spain, and Troy. We also know that shortly before the British came from Troy, the Etruscans moved out and they moved out around 650-600 BC and from the same area, Phrygia, in the Trojan edge of Turkey. So we have another possible link between Turkey, the Etrurian Empire, which lasted 650-100 to 100 BC in Italy, and of, of again, in Rhaetia in Italy, and of, of again, in Rhaetia, which is now part of Switzerland. Because Pliny the Elder kindly tells us the Rhaetians were Etruscan. What we did then was to identify that the alphabets in all these areas anciently were very similar. You could say near identical. We were encouraged to do this because a man named John Williams in 1846 wrote a book and in his book he exhibited the ancient Colburn British alphabet and in exhibiting it he gave the cipher in other words, what's an A, what's a B, what's a C? And he also said, isn't it strange that the British alphabet is almost identical with Etruscan and with Pelasgian on the coast of Turkey? Well, it's not strange at all if that's where we ancestrally come from and if that's where the Etruscans come from and we are roughly kinsmen. There is a tie-up in that Llewellyn Sean of uh, Glamorgan in 1560 preserved the alphabet and preserved its cipher. In other words, he wrote down which sign is A, which is B, which is C, which is D, right through. He also wrote down which signs were numerals, one, two, three, four, five, six. And so we have an alphabet and we know the lettering. If we know the lettering, obviously if we see a series of signs, we put the appropriate letters underneath, out will pop a word. That word will be in Cymric, in Welsh, and we should be able to translate it into English or French or German or any other language for people to read. If we look at the name of the people, it becomes more interesting. The proper name of the people you would know as Welsh is Cymru. In the modern 12th, 20th century, it's popular to use the word C, but the correct spelling is K-H-U-M-R-Y. In ancient Turkey, they were known by the Greeks as the Kimmeroi, C-I-M-M-E-R-O-I, right? They were known by Herodotus, writing in around 460 BC, as the Chimerians. They moved out of Iraq and Iran, northern areas, out of Assyria, I think when Sennacherib was murdered by one of his sons, and civil war erupted in the Assyrian Empire. The records of the Assyrian emperors dug up at Nineveh and taken to the British Museum, 25,000 clay tablets, exhibit these very same people as the Cymri, K-H-U-M-R-Y, exactly the spelling and name that they have in Britain. The Assyrian emperors got these people from a place we would know as Israel, and they would appear to be the ten tribes. So there is a clear linkage of people right the way back. We decided that we would attempt to translate the ancient stones in Britain, which are known to be of the year 200 AD in one instance, uh, those in Aberdeen and Angus in Scotland are known to be 6th century. There are stones in Galloway, uh, said to be 6th century. There are stones in Cumbria, northwest England, again of the same era. There are stones dug up in St. Paul's Churchyard in London, known to the Dark Age. And there are a number of stones in Wales and a number of church fonts. One of them is an ancient oak font. It 
it's, it's made from the stump of an oak tree carved into a font and an inscription around the, around the thing. It actually names Arthael, who is the Welsh spelling of Arthur, famously. So we've got a number of stones all over the place. We simply applied the alphabet to these stones. In other words, that sign is A, that's B, that's C, or whatever. We then had, under the list of signs, we had a list of modern letters. Those modern letters formed words, and we were able to read what the stones say. So a stone put up in Nevin in West Wales, around 950, turns out to be inscribed with the name of Higgywell Rex, and in all the manuscripts, Higgywell Rex is Howell the, Howell the Good, who ruled the area and died in 948, and if the stones put up around 950, that's right. Uh, the ruins of his court under Upper Court Farm and Lower Court Farm are about six to eight miles away, and about, I think, six miles away is Krug Howell, the heap of Howell, his grave mound. So he fits. We found another stone in Wales, interesting one, it said, Godufan the Exile. Godufan is a bit of a mouthful of a name, hardly inventable. And we find around 200 AD, a British king named Godufan was indeed deposed. It says in the records, Godufan was a turbulent, mad and wild king, for which reason he was deposed, exiled, and his brother Frun placed in his stead. And it goes on right through Britain. You can translate all the stones with correct meaning and naming people and giving a little, bit, a little more historical detail as well. This encouraged us to tackle Etruscan inscriptions. So we looked for Etruscan inscriptions. Now you'll find in Britain a lot of books, not many about Etruria. It's not popular in Britain, presumably, presumably it's considered to be Italian. So whilst the Romans are much publicized, the Italians and are the Etruscans and. And we found great volumes of uh, Etru Etruscan pictures of statues and ruined buildings and tomb mounds, but it was very hard to get at inscriptions. When we started to get to them, we found that they were little ones on wine bottles, on bronze mirrors, which were carved with scenes with statements, uh, on the sides of statues, uh, all sorts of minor artifacts that people would use, have, would, would have inscriptions on them. Uh, we were able to translate these without any difficulty whatsoever. And what we did know, and it's unmistakable, that some of these, particularly on, say, wine bottles, are pithy little humorous statements. And they unmistakably have the dry humor and the dry sort of self-depreciating wit that we associate with Jewish people. There's no doubt about this. And we therefore went further. We looked at, uh, there's one very famous uh, inscription, they found a, a tomb of a princess or a great noble lady in one of the Etruscan uh, cemeteries, untouched, and they found within this tomb a large amount of silver um, of tableware. It's virtually an ancient tea set or dining set in silver. And this has been translated, uh, if you can use the word translated, to mean uh, Lafia, and they then said, aha, Lafia is the woman who owns this stuff, you see? And they even gave it a second name. And what they're doing is taking the Etruscan letter, finding the nearest Greek letter that matches it, and then reading in Latin. Although Pliny and a number of other writers tell them time and time and time again that the Etruscan language is nothing whatsoever remotely like Latin or Greek. And though they're told this, they can't resist doing something about it. In other words, the academic can never say, I don't know. And he feels, he feels he's writing to an uninformed audience who don't know either, and he can get away with it. So we translated this Lafia stuff. It was very interesting, because it actually says, the gift to lie silent in the, in the tomb, and words to that effect. And it doesn't say Lafia at all. So. And uh, realizing we were onto a winner, we translated a lot of the major Etruscan texts. We translated the Perugia Keepus, a large stone slab with like a great gravestone with 36 lines of detailed writing on it. And it tells how 12 uh, clan or tribal units of a people are setting up a union. And in this unified state, they will divide the land equally amongst themselves. They will cooperate to drain the land, to irrigate it, to fertilize it, to clear the swamps, the woods, and to make it productive, and they will not war with each other, they will attempt to cooperate. It's, uh, I don't know, like a constitution, in, in a sense. Uh, we then uh, translated other major statements. Um, 
we found the three gold tablets that, that were known as the Purgy tablets from a temple at the port of Carrere. I, that's the Welsh way of pronouncing it. Uh, it was the ancient Etruscan port near Rome, a major city area with three ports. And these little gold tablets, one's in uh, Carthaginian and two are in Etruscan. They've not been read. Uh, we're able to find that they tell of the League of the Etruscans and Carthaginians to provide 60 warships each to combine fleet to attack the Greek provide 60 warships each to combine fleet to attack the Greek Phocian pilots pilots who'd settled on the Isle of Sardinia and get rid of them. The Greeks had been driven out uh, from or opted out from Turkey on the, the shores of there, and they'd come away when Cyrus had become Emperor of Persia sent his general Harper to say, and they had decided to set up in Sardinia and to make a living robbing the merchant fleets of the Carthaginians and the Etruscans. And it's well known that this league was formed, the whole story is well recorded by ancient authors, and here we have it repeated on the Purgy tablets, so we know that we're in authentic history. The other major text we deciphered in Etruria was the Agnoli tablet in the British Museum, a large bronze tablet, 26 lines of writing on one side, a lesser amount on the other side, and it tells who the Etruscans were and where they came from before they got to Etruria, and I think therefore it's a very important tablet. Um, it says that they were in a country uh, happily, there was huge pestilence and plague and all sorts of cosmic disasters, they were led out of this country and they went with the little cabinet in a cart and they follow this little cabinet which is in a cart and they finally arrive at another land where it is their own land and it's given to them and they settle there and live there I'm obviously paraphrasing what it says and later on the other side it says how they are forcibly removed and ejected from this land of their own and they are taken to another place which they don't like and again, they followed the little cabinet in the cart, and the little cart were presumably drawn by oxen or donkeys or something. And off goes the little cart, and they follow it. And they come to a place, and they take ship, and in ships they come to Etruria. It appears the Cymri are moving off from northern Assyria through uh, Asia Minor, coming to the Dardanelles. They take ship, and they go around to Etruria. That's what it appears to be telling us. And obviously the earlier side, the other side, would appear to be that they're in Egypt and there's the, the cataclysms in Egypt in the time of Moses, they're led out by Moses, they follow the little ark in the cabinet, the, the, the cabinet, whatever it is in, in the car, and they off they go to their own land, their promised land. So I think it's probably one of the most important documents we've read so far. Now having got that far, we then said, well, what have they got in Phrygian, you know, areas in, in Turkey and we found one very long inscription straight away much publicized and it's over the top of a building which is, looks like a, a temple to us and it is described actually as the tomb of Midas and when we looked at this long inscription right, right over the top and right down the side it reads out perfectly into Cumric again and there's no doubt whatsoever about it. Now whether the inscription was added to an existing temple building or whether it was put up by the builders of the building is another matter. There's no doubt whatsoever it's a form of how half's prayer and it's very unlikely that that's a tomb, it's probably a temple building. So we were now in a position of translating all the ancient British stones, we were in a position of translating any Etruscan inscription we come across or we wish to translate and getting sense. We turned to Hraithia where certain small inscriptions have been preserved and we mopped them up in no time they also translate into Cumric, and we know from Pliny that the Raetians in Switzerland are Etruscans who move north. So we've got a constant pit in the same way as there was devastation in the world tomorrow, and uh, New Zealand was the only place that escaped. It's quite possible that in later years New Zealanders would drift into ravaged America and would find documents that they could read in their own language, their own tongue, and the same in Canada, and they'd finally work their way back to the UK and read what was left there. And this is all we're doing. We're doing what Alex Haley did in a much more, uh, we're not quite in, in the family uh, genre that he's in, we're into a national sort of situation, but we're following our national roots right the way back as far as we can. 
Interestingly, the Welsh have always said that their language is the language of the angels and the language and alphabet is the language of heaven. Now they say that in those words. And here we have it called the language of the angels and the language of heaven in the Nag Hammadi scrolls in the Gnostic Library. That's precisely the same definition they give of the same alphabet. It's the language of God, the language of heaven. So we had now accomplished that which uh, pleased us uh, because it, really we were verifying the basic and fundamental accuracy of British history as we know it and as it has been flung aside and derided. And you've got to realize that the average Englishman has been persuaded that uh, he's an Anglo-Saxon and therefore anything before 500 AD doesn't apply to him and is to be booted out and got rid, in the same way as the Americans came here and got rid of the Indian culture and histories. But the thing is, you'd think that they'd have learned something. Over there, they'd been there longer. Uh, actually, very few English people are Angles or Saxons. And the phrases that I hear used, like an Anglo-American agreement, are just absurd. It's like saying a, a British-Minnesota agreement for the USA. Very few people in Britain are Angles. You, what you're saying is you've got an agreement with the county of Northumberland. It's a, a complete absurd piece of nomenclature. Um, tiny numbers of them were Saxons on the, the coast of, of Kent and uh, around Sussex and Dorset around there, the Isle of Wight. And certainly the bulk of the population is ancient Gutian, it's Vandal Mercian, it's British, and it's picked in the British uh, from the Brutus people of Troy, the Trojans, the Cymry, and from the Syrians. And the idea that they're Angles and Saxons is just about the daftest thing you'll ever heard. But they've been persuaded that they are. And the, the strange thing is this, the Welsh, uh, in the persons of the Cymry, uh, attacked northern France, as is well known, they attacked Europe, uh, the British, in 383. And the two major principalities that endured uh, were Brittany, still does, and Ludo. Ludo became Normandy in 852, when the Normans were aided by the French king to attack the place and install Rome of North the Ganger. But a Welshman can go over and speak Welsh to Bretons today, and in a very short time they're understanding each other. And a Breton can come to Wales and speak to the Welsh and understand each other. But it's very strange that no Angle and no Saxon, as we call them, no Englishman, can go to Germany and speak to Germans, and they never could. So there's got to be something wrong. Now, Welsh records of 826 say very clearly that the language which prevailed in England and became the national language is the language of the Isinglass. It's the language of the Iceni. The Iceni are the great big tribe who were led by a uh, tribal nation, led by Boudicca, Bodicea, in her attack upon the Romans the time of Nero. So this is the language of, of England, not Angle and not Saxon. And then, then you've got a question, is it Angle or is it Saxon? You can't have Anglo-Saxon. It's like saying we've got French Yugoslavian. What is it? And it's neither. So we have a number of fictions in this wonderful uh, home of tradition in England. Uh, interesting situation. Can we stop there for a minute? I have a cup of coffee. I'm going to observe. <laughs> You're wonderful. Mm. Blackett does it. He's, he's not as erudite, but his, his mind is... Uh, would have made a uh, good professor. Do you like some uh, No, or I'm, some I'm fine. Are you okay? Uh, but oh. since we can... I don't want to... <clears throat> i tell you, Alan, we were doing some decent... PR stuff with you here because it looks like you're in a very comfortable home situation. I backed off a couple of times, got the fireplace. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like, hey, I'm, yeah. I'm This guy knows me. Knows me well. Off. <laughs> it's called fireside chat. Yeah. <laughs> FDRs. And I don't believe it. For what grade? Uh, he retired from work at the age of 19. He had a job, but he cracked the job in and said that he wished to go on Social Security in order to look after his father. No, uh, I looked after my parents for quite a time when they were old, and my grandmother as well. I looked after my parents for quite a time when they were old, and my grandmother as well. But I did it by going out to work and getting someone else to clean the house. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. But he decided he would pack in. Now, the first thing Major did as a political action, he joined the Conservative Party, became very enthusiastic. So, 
and you've got to be boneheaded to do that. And he then proceeded to uh, set himself up and got himself nominated to be a councillor in a ward, I think it's Wandsworth. But in that area, you have to live in the, the ward in order to stand as councillor. And so he produced a, a form, signed it, and gave his address, which was within the ward, and he somehow got himself elected. It's subsequently been found that this house that he said he lived in is still lived in by the same resident for the last 50 odd years. Mm. Certainly before, she's a woman in her 80s, well before Major was born. Mm -hmm. And they've been to her on TV and said, did he ever live here? And she says, no. <laughs> Do you know him? <laughs> no. When they showed him a photograph, she said, I've never seen him in her life, and he's the Prime Minister. <laughs> 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 and so his first political action was a forgery. Now, he could be taken to court for that and prosecuted. And if I make money out of this and become a millionaire, I'm going to do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, because it's time somebody told politicians in Britain that they are bound by the law, like anybody else. It's time somebody straightened them up. So when you talk to me about John Major, I don't want to know. You know if ever a man shouldn't be dissent, he's a complete lying fraud. And I don't think he's going to do any good for Britain. I think he's worse than Thatcher, and that's a, a little bit like saying, you know, worse than Genghis Khan or something you know, from the outside. Because that woman will go down subsequently when people come to write the histories of the biggest disaster ever, ever to hit the British Isles. Can you imagine uh, selling the water rights to a private company that jacks the price up and can charge anything they want with a monopoly or the power company? We as a people used to own the electric companies. We as a people used to own the gas companies and the water companies. We owned them. They belonged to the nation. And they were damn good. Yeah. And uh, to sell them off privately and to allow foreign investors to buy large lumps of it is, it is beyond belief. To buy a monopoly and then they can charge anything they mm -hmm. want. The first thing, 30% jump in the cost. Yeah. And <gasps> Electric prices went up 46% in 15 months. Hmm. And I wonder how we can afford to live there. Mm -hmm. And the result is now, uh, I told you when I first met you, I think, uh, all of a sudden over there, people are now finally saying that we need this damn monarchy. Mm -hmm. Because the attack is focusing onto something and it, it's, it's swinging around to focus on them, you see. And uh, the ruling elite needs the monarchy. They need the puppet, the theatre, mm -hmm. to mesmerise people mm -hmm. with this. I mean, people sell magazines over here of Fergie mm -hmm. and Diana. Mm -hmm. And Diana's a redundant school teacher, a long, skinny, gawky piece, a nice lady, mm -hmm. a nice person. There's no doubt about that, but you pass her in the street. The other one's a fat little, dumpy person with uh, apparently uh, no personality, no manners. And, uh, and uh, she's the horse trainer's daughter. So one's a redundant school teacher, and the other's a horse trainer's daughter. And this family is covering themselves with, I mean, the Queen's sister, Margaret, ran around with Bobby Llewellyn for about 12 years, in front of her husband, a man 10 years her junior. And finally, there was the inevitable divorce. It should have happened earlier. Uh, Charles' sister, the Queen's daughter, Anne, had the same sort of performance with her husband, and finally there's a divorce there. Uh, Cal Windsor, his, his marriage with this Diana is, is obviously, it's on the rocks whether you like it or not. Mm -hmm. And he does not behave himself. His younger brother's had a disaster with this silly woman that he married, this Fergie they call her, and her lecherous father, who well, is no credit to anybody, and is whitewashed in films over here, you know, that was photographed in and out of all the massage parlors and, and brothels of London. And, uh, the whole, the whole gang of them, uh, uh, Montbatten, who got himself blown up, had the largest collection of uh, pornography that you could imagine. Was a complete weirdo. Uh, this is not generally known, you know. Was a professional collection of pornographic material. Uh, the whole lot of them are in disarray, aren't they? And now you've got books being published showing that George V was the second son of Edward VIII, and why didn't Edward, the eldest son of Edward VIII, become king in 1908? Oh, was it 19... yeah, or 1912 or something. And everybody says, oh yeah, he was the eldest son, why didn't he become king? You see? What happened to him? 
and they had him locked away somewhere in some castle in Scotland with the Bowles Lion family, I told you. Mm -hmm. And so the whole thing stinks. So the present queen shouldn't be queen. The guy living in Paris should be king. And uh, I think they're in trouble. I think they're in desperate trouble. Mm -hmm. So I can see why anything that we say might actually shake the whole mm -hmm. jelly-like edifice. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. so. Wouldn't be very pleasant, would it? Not to the queen. Well, I, I mean, I mean, they, they started this battle with us, in, if mm. you call it that, in that uh, we didn't know any of this when we started up. We were just looking for King Arthur. That's all. We just looking for King Arthur. You know? <laughs> and they could have played it a different way mm -hmm. and started it a different way. Anyway, enough, enough of them. But Major... Okay, if we want to do something for Diane Sawyer, what did you have in mind exactly? Did anything you know? Exactly. What does she want? What does she want to know? What's she going to do her program on? I what think is she inscriptions. Do? I think that's the important part, the alphabet. And I think that uh, the statement that we need from Alan is that uh, there is an alphabet, that <clears throat> this alphabet appears to have been that alphabet of the Welsh-speaking Indians, which is well documented, an alphabet that was discovered and identified by Schoolcroft, who later became ethnology uh, director. Uh, they knew it was British. They knew that it was, uh, uh, had at least 14 old British characters and maybe 12 uh, uh, characters that were Iberian. That should have told them right there, but he didn't write to anybody. He simply, uh, he, he didn't write to the Welsh. He, he wrote to Copenhagen and he wrote to France, they identified it as an alphabet, and he wrote to several places in the Mediterranean in Europe. And then, uh, unfortunately, uh, they got him so confused that it was totally thrown out in history, but that alphabet and that inscription was there in 1840s, found in 1828. Uh, in, in 89 was when we identified the fact that this alphabet was an alphabet of the Brits, and that it uh, was the alphabet used by the Welsh-speaking Indians. And uh, then Alan comes into the picture because he starts translating the inscriptions that we have, and we have now 40, over 40 inscriptions on this continent using this same alphabet. And Alan is tied. Uh, tell him about that, Alan. Mm -hmm. You're tied to an alphabet and to a language, yeah, and you can't... Well, what, we've, what we've got is an impeccably authentic alphabet, which I demonstrated amply elsewhere, traces back 2,000, 2,000, 3,000 years into the Middle East. The uh, sources of proof are multiple, in other words, hundreds. Uh, we know that uh, these people, we knew by 83 these people had come to America, so we weren't surprised to find the alphabet here. It translates perfectly uh, in that there are stones in America which have the alphabet upon them, we apply the cipher to it, which we have. We know which uh, letter of the alphabet applies to which sign. We get coherent, legible, sensible results. So we know that these people, whoever they were, were using A, the old British alphabet, and B, it's in the Cumbric language. They were speaking Cumbric. They were speaking Cumbric Welsh. And that much we know immediately. That can tie then directly into manuscript sources of well-authenticated, very detailed, multiple sources of British history of voyages here. And that's where we stand at this moment of time. I think that's what we need, that's the exact message that we need to send today. I don't know if you got my portion of it or not. Let's do it again, it's up to you. Uh, let me do this. I think, I think and he, not what you would call able struck to out. Do. Well, he certainly did, but well, uh, in Britain we'd right, say he, he, made, he made zero, that means he made a duck's egg, he made a duck, a duck's egg, zero, <laughs> zilch, they call it making a duck, and uh, Over he, here, he struck out. Military ter terms is getting the Maggie's drawers. He, he certainly, he certainly. I, you remember that. <laughs> he certainly uh, got the zero, you know. The thing is that what I can't comprehend is who on earth appointed the Cyrus Thomases in the John Leslie Powell's of the world, and how on earth did these people have the arrogance to pontificate the way they did, mm -hmm. and get away with it? And what is wrong with, uh, I thought the Americans were sort of 
people of um, get up and go that they wouldn't stand for nonsense. And here I find them bowing down and scraping to long dead idiots, you know? Instead of taking these people on and, and tearing them to shreds, you know? I mean, they left you a legacy of stupidity. So Unfortunately, they just didn't have the expertise to do it back in 1840, and that's the answer. Yeah, but I mean, this is the modern uh, world, and this is the world of the telephone and the express letter, the airplane, the gold air. This is, this is the the world where you can send a book from one country to the other. You can almost you can fax it. This is the world of transfer of information, and I find no information crossing anywhere to anywhere because they don't seem to realize they need it. Uh, you know, I, I said you could say various things about books, and I've been, I've been absolutely bewildered what is not on this continent with all your wealth and your resources, what you don't have. And I find it uh, a matter of you know, concern that uh, somebody isn't saying, well, we'll get some of them all. I mean, I, I think with a library of, say, 12 books, I mean, uh, you've got one book printed where people did a great service to everybody in that they. They got all the ancient Welsh triads, all the, the music that they could gather, they got all the ancient histories, about a dozen of them, they got all the ancient Welsh poetry they could gather, hundreds of poems, and they put it in a one thick book of several thousand pages, like a vast Bible. It is the British Bible, because the, the Bible to me is only the Jewish history book of philosophy and history and mm -hmm. whatever. Mm -hmm. And here is this Bible of the Brits in one book. Yeah. And you only need that one book and you could conquer this situation standing on your head. And I marvel that uh, nobody's even got a copy of that book. Oh, with a dozen books, you could do the whole thing, no problem. Well, it's 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 meant, made a real dilemma to the academicians on this continent because on every continent in the world, these inscriptions are an important part of archaeological evidence. But on this continent, because the mindset is such that there was no inscriptions and they simply threw out Schoolcroft's work and others. Therefore, it didn't exist, and they went right on with their setting up of the historical records in which no one came before Columbus. Now, whether that was politically motivated because we didn't want to deal with these people living here, the Indians, the Melungeons, the Native Americans, uh, whether or not that was the political mo don't know, wow. don't care. The important thing is that this inscription was there the mass evidence of historic uh, manuscripts documenting this mm. event, uh, now that we can tag right to it, mm. uh, is all in place. And it, yes, it is diffusional. Yes, it is a uh, migration of people that may have come and gone back mm. some of. But the importance is that it's been left out of our history books and it's left, been left off of our historical markers and we are bulldozing this evidence daily into obscurity and that's got to stop uh, not only this evidence but but the other evidence that's here and some of it is still thank god in our museums well the, the you know if you in defense of school huh? yeah uh, and others sure. um, if they went to britain for evidence they would have been confronted with the most um jingoistic, and that means extreme nationalist, yeah. bunch of idiots that you'd ever meet on planet Earth. Well, they'd gone to England, you mean? And yeah, you'd have, they'd have gone into London, and they'd have gone oh. to the great universities of London, and Oxford, and Oxford, Cambridge, Cambridge, and they'd have been confronted with people who were patently dishonest. You've only got to read A History of Britain, written by an Oxford professor of 1864, which I've got, and it's it's absolutely rabid nationalism, you know, England, 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 and, and really the United Kingdom is really England uber allies. The others are appendages, and, you know, that they cling on to. And there was a great need psychologically with their great empire ideas, and the empire was going to last a thousand years, like Adolf Hitler's Reich. And they saw themselves as a sort of third empire, Greece, the great cultural empire they imagined, and then Rome, the great cultural and political trading empire, and now they were the great empire of the world, they envisaged themselves in this light. So they taught their children ancient Greek history and ancient Roman history uh, in preference to ancient British history, which as Anglo-Saxons they felt was not part of them because he came from Germany. They had Albert of saxe coburg Gotha married to Victoria, both Germans mm -hmm. who were on the throne, very unpopular when they started out. 
They had a German monarchy, which for over 300 years, no British person married into, mm. right? And you have a situation where people were very anxious to destroy and tear down what they saw as the fringe uh, histories of Ireland, mm -hmm. Scotland and Wales. And the Welsh were probably the biggest menace to this uh, psychological sort of ascendancy that they wanted. And so if Schoolcraft arrived there, he'd have been told, all British history is rubbish, Troy does not exist, British history is founded on Troy, it's all a big lie. And uh, you read phrases like a barbarous, ignorant nation which, in mm. seeking an ancient sort of heritage, decided they would adopt Troy and the Trojans and falsely did this. And I've got books saying this. Then, of course, Heinrich Schliemann comes along in 1873. Of course, Heinrich Schliemann doesn't know that the English have officially declared Troy to be a fiction. And in his ignorance, he transgresses and he digs up Troy. And that's why you still find English scholars in, in London and Oxford, Cambridge and elsewhere are very nervous about Troy. Because if Troy is not a fiction, then British history is not a fiction. And if <coughs> British history is not a fiction, you have the English uh, in the role of the Romans. You know, you create a desert and you call it civilization. And therefore, they are very much in, in the dock. They're, they're on trial. And even today you'll find English people are very anxious to write books saying, um, you know, did Troy really exist? Because they, mm. they're still nervous about this this genocide that they mm. attempted. You know, and it is a genocide and they were at it for 700 years, mm. desperately trying to kill off the Gaelic in Scotland and Ireland, desperately passing law after law, iniquitous uh, legislation, to deliberately kill off the Cymric language in Wales. To eliminate it, because they felt this was the way to make everybody good at Englishmen. So basically, we're saying... Schoolcraft would have been misled yeah. by these people. They would have said, oh, it didn't exist, and therefore, as British history's fiction, this alphabet it, described by Caesar and mm. Strabo and Ammianus Marcellinus and on coins and on yeah. stones is also a fiction. And he, they would have led him right up the garden path. Throw it out. I, guess, but, oh, I, I think he, Dr. Goebbels must have studied at Oxford or Cambridge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he'd fit in very well. So now that they found Troy, all you're asking is, give us back our history. Yeah, we'd like our history back, please, if you... Thank you very in, much. Uh, don't mind. You and uh, what we're saying on this continent is, give, us, give us back our history. Thank you very much. Yeah. And it's the same history. And there are 12,000 mm. descendants on this continent. No, there are 12 million. Oh, 12 well, million. Yes. Welsh descendants on this continent, and uh, only four living there. Yeah, but you've also got. There. Yeah, but you've also got uh, people from Anglo, what's called Anglo-Saxon, but yeah. a Icenic background, writing the Iceni language uh -huh. on this continent. On this continent, because there are three inscriptions, inscriptions very clearly in Icenic. Yes. On this continent yes. again, and of antiquity. So you you probably had a few Irish people and, and came along for the ride as well. I would think so. Be and surprised sure. if they didn't. Yeah. And snake worshippers. Well, so, so uh, really, Schoolcraft was in a, in a no-win situation because he was uh, entering entering a country which was on a a nationalistic high, mm -hmm. and this was the uh, not in in the same vicious way, but uh, in in a different way but a political Third Reich situation mm. in 1850 in the UK. And they were beating the drum, their wonderful achievements. They suddenly had railway engines that would run anywhere, you know, and move anything, huge loads and people. They now didn't rely on the wind. They had steamships and sail the oceans. They made ships out of iron, whereas for 3,000 years they been made out of wood. They were, they thought, ruling most of the world, India and lumps of Africa and God knows where. And so they were on, on a sort of mental height. And therefore it was inconceivable that their ancestry should not be superior to that of others. And this, this was the mental situation, the froth into which schoolcraft would have entered. And they'd have sent him in ever decreasing circles. Well, he certainly did. <laughs> it got him confused well, in spite of the fact yeah. that uh, on that stone, there's a big British cross on the bottom. He ignored that. And yet... Uh, it shouted out to him if these people were in fact Christians. Mm. So, what do you do? We're not up against the situation of, um, what do we say? Uh, if this were put into a court of law with a prosecution and a defense, right? Uh, before the jury, uh, we'd win easily. There's no question at all about that. But, uh, 
this, the facts and the evidence come down irrevo irrevocably in favor of this alphabet, its integrity, its authenticity, and its accuracy, and also in favor of the accuracy of the histories we're dis discussing. But the trouble is to get it into open discussion, into the open public forum. Because, you see, apart from anything else, people in universities uh, have only one thing generally, and that's their reputation. And the reputation is the most fragile entity on the face of planet Earth. And if they have nailed their flags too firmly to the wrong mast, then they perceive they're in def definitely desperate trouble. And so we are up against a situation where I think the main uh, problem we face is actually getting the evidence into the open and getting mm. the evidence mm. displayed, explained, and publicly examined and dis discussed. I think it should be. And that's, yeah, but that's your problem. That's the problem. Because a man who knows that he's going to lose will go to court and say to the judge, Your Honor, please do not allow this evidence into court. It is inadmissible evidence. Mm -hmm. Now, in court in America today, I've seen some films, and they say, you can't allow this evidence into court. They didn't have a search warrant when they found this, so that's this right. murderer is not a murderer. You see? Because the guy who found the gun didn't have a warrant to find the gun. Now, what they're saying is exactly the same thing. They're saying, aha, that evidence was not found by a university archaeologist. Mm. Therefore, it is inadmissible. But if you think, how many archaeologists are there in universities? Very, very few. Mm. So, the ma and the majority of them do not spend their time tramping the hills and woods. They're mainly in big cities and sitting down lecturing and telling students a pack <coughs> of nonsense, right? And therefore, the chances of archaeologists finding something is actually remote. Most things that are found in Britain are found by workmen digging a trench. They're digging a sewer. They find the palace of King Cogidubnus, which has been lost for 1800 years. You know, and they find a Roman villa when somebody wanted to build a, a barn uh, in Gwent. And uh, when he wanted to build his barn, they, <laughs> they found a Roman villa. Then they found a whole Roman town along the river. Then they found a whole Roman cemetery with stone sarcophagus because somebody wanted to build a barn. So archaeologists don't actually go out and find things. But that isn't necessarily the case because those government employees at Loudoun County were working and took the material straight to the uh, mm. to the uh, Smithsonian. That is on record. Uh, they yeah. were pre-archaeologists, but they were trained to do what they did. But the stance and is they have the stance is, Your Honor, this evidence is inadmissible because it proves it's wrong and loses our case. Uh -huh. That's the nub of it. Isn't that the truth? And yet, therefore, you could say in this case, nearly everything in the world is inadmissible. Arab youths found the Dead Sea Scrolls, not an archaeologist. Mm. An Arab goat herd found the cache of the pharaohs in uh, Egypt, at Del Al uh, Abir. And he, he found 36 pharaohs in, in a cave. An mm. archaeologist didn't find them. Mm. Of course not. And then they found another cache of over 140 minor mm. royal bodies. Again, Arabs found it. Mm -hmm. Mm. And you'll find almost anything and everything that has actually been found, very little of it has been as a result of scientific examination of the histories in order to see if the histories are correct. It's almost always a chance find. The boats found at Chepstow in Wales two years ago mm -hmm. on the river. <coughs> Somebody is digging on the riverbank where there was an ancient port recorded. The archaeologists and historians have ignored it totally. Nobody's ever gone along and said, let's have a trial see if it's a boat here. Somebody nothing to do with the colleges, finds timber. He recognizes it may be old, he reports it. Result, 26 foot boat, 1500 years old. Mm. Not told by the Ethiopians. Because it, the chances of them doing it, if you think of it, unless, unless they study the history and say, by analysis, this site should yield something, Yes. but their chances, everything they, is accidental. They don't use the historical records they don't. But you also have a different mindset over there because uh, within uh, two hours there was an archaeologist on hand. Within 24 hours you had uh, 50,000 pounds, $80,000. Mm. And in uh, six months? Six weeks. Six yeah. weeks? Half a million dollars. Half a million. And they got both of them. Yeah. But the point is, what they're trying to say, as I perceive it here, is if it is not actually found mm. by an archaeologist, mm. in other words, Mm. A man goes out hunting, stumbles on a, something in the woods, a sculpted head, right? Right. You can't, that is now contaminated evidence oh, yeah. because he's not an archaeologist. Another guy goes somewhere, finds something in a cave. 
Uh, uh, pity you did that. It's not contaminated. It's not archaeological evidence. You know, this is an imbecile attitude. The idea is that 250 million Americans are a bunch of liars, and only about 1,000 people are to be trusted. And they're the archaeologists. Mm, that it, and most of them are interested in Egypt and Greece and elsewhere. And it brings you down to about 20 people at the end of the day mm. in colleges who are saying only we are to be trusted to find anything. And we're not going to bother. And if you find something, we're going to ignore it because it's contaminated because you found it, not me. Can't be true because I didn't think of it. And they certainly are ignoring our historians and say it must be true because it's here in the history. Yeah. And uh, what we're saying is give us back our history. That's what he's saying. Yeah, there, there is something seriously, seriously wrong. Mm. It, it's uh, unbelievably wrong. And I think schoolcraft would have been misled in England, definitely. And nobody in England would bother to go 150 miles to the Welsh border to find out. And if he did, he would energetically conceal that which he discovered. But uh, there was a university in 1840, certainly, uh, set up in Wales. It was probably bigger than Oxford. No, there were the beginnings of a university I in Aberystwyth. It has now grown. Uh, I think the University of Wales has 18,000 students. Mm -hmm. uh, There's 12,000 in Cardiff. Mm -hmm. uh, so the University of Wales has grown, but the Welsh universities in antiquity did exist mm -hmm. in the Dark Ages. Oh, yeah. And three Welsh scholars were taken to found Oxford University. But often the great, I think, in the year 900. So mm -hmm. he had to get them from Wales, too. Because mm -hmm. nobody in England could read and write at the time. And that's recorded by Alfred. So you begin there. But certainly we had universities until about, say, 1100. And they were destroyed by the persistent attacks. The, the first attack of... Uh, they were destroyed by the persistent attacks. The, the first attack of, of uh, the English uh, in Wales was always at the churches and the universities. Um, when the Welsh invaded parts of England, certainly about the year 1200 or so, uh, some of the soldiers asked their leader if they should, you know, move the churches, and he said no. He said the English anger God by attacking churches, we won't do it. And so there was a different attitude. You got offered of mercy at attacking churches in Wales in 826, mm. presumably because he thought there'd be something there. And you have Edgar of the English attacking the monasteries and churches again for loot in 800 and, in 1050, and then having fits of remorse and sending bells back to Welsh churches that he'd looted because he thought well, God wouldn't like it and he might not get through the buildings. So you've got a slightly different attitude, but certainly they were in, in antiquity. Caesar recalls the British universities again, mm -hmm. but uh, by 1100 they'd managed to destroy this but everything. So he would have found plenty of schools and minor colleges in, in, in Wales. There were minor institutions. We had a, uh, we listened to a presenter in Columbus, Georgia, talk about the two serpent mounds in Kentucky, four in Ohio, two in uh, West Virginia. And he said that the only place in the world that those serpent mounds existed was mm. uh, on this continent. And you said, that's no, not so. Mm. Well, uh, you know that St. Patrick is a Glamorgan man from South Wales. Sure. He's born in Tyronan, which is about uh, three ashes. Mm -hmm. It's about 12 miles from Cardiff, mm -hmm. somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, he went to the College of Kyawagan, which later became Van Eldley Bow. So they had a, a university college there in 430. 430. And uh, they were teaching Greek and Latin and mathematics and astrology and astronomy and all these things. Patrick. Um, that's on the Glamorgan coast, no, mm -hmm. that we measure. Patrick went over to Ireland in uh, apparently the, the 434, mm -hmm. and his target was to throw the snakes out of Ireland. Mm -hmm. And as you know, you can go to Ireland and there's plenty of grass snakes there. I don't sure. think they have any poisonous snakes, like mm -hmm. you get the adder and the viper in Britain. Mm -hmm. And uh, the snakes he was throwing out are actually stone snakes. Mm -hmm the great stone curb snakes, snake worshippers. Oh, worshippers. Because the record is that he went to the circle, which would be the egg in the mouth of the snake. Sure. I think the snake is a great comet swallowing the sun, you see, blotting it out. Ah, and, uh, oh. literate, you know. interesting. And uh, he lit his fire in the center of the circle in the snake's yeah. mouth, which yeah. is a ritual fire. So he, writ he lit a druidic fire. Right. Uh, because you realize early Christianity in Britain, particularly in Wales, was uh, a welded Christianity druidic religion. It, was, it wasn't it was a, a melding together of the two. 
and by lighting his fire in the circle in the uh, mouth of the snake, he desecrated it as far as the snake worshippers yeah. were concerned. They arrived to do their big ceremony and oh dear, he's desecrated the site. And uh, he went as a target to the king and, and, and others and his target really was the court to convert the nobility. Well, are there other references to stone snakes being disassembled? Oh yeah, they, they, were, they were still um, uh, dozens of references in the lives of the saints, particularly in Brittany, of people going and ridding the area of great serpents that were a nuisance to the parish or community and tearing the stones down. So, you know, so, and you've got references to people ridding an area of great worms, as they call these mm. great serpents in the ground, as late as 1350, 1400 in England. It clung on in Northern England. And I think the situation you've got is that the local lord is sitting there quite happily running the area and uh, every once or twice a, a week or a month the, the local priest banging on his door and saying look you've got to do something about this lot you know mm. and they're, they're coming to church Sunday or some of them are coming but every Friday night they're up on the hill there you know lighting fires and you know I want this sorted and finally Sir Humphrey or whatever says oh dear dear gets his men and off they go and they tear the serpent apart you see them to no. and he's then recorded as slaying the dragon the great worm and in some cases you these people lie on their, their, their the effigies lie on their table tombs where they you know mm. pull their effigy and their sword and they're the dragon slayers but actually what they've done is to tear apart a serpent mount but uh, certainly the serpents that patrick threw out of ireland were not the grass snakes which are still there but uh were the, he, the snake certainly goes back uh, in mythological and religious uh, antiquity mm. to how far back do you say does it go back? Well, the Greeks represented Zeus as a gigantic serpent. Okay. The Maccabean kings of uh, Judea, the right? Galilean family, okay. Judas Maccabeus and his sons, uh, the Hasmonean kings they know, uh, they made coins and on all their coins they showed Jehovah, Yahweh, Yahweh. as a, a human serpent with serpent legs and serpent appendages and he's described as the great serpent. And if you get into the Nag Hammadi, Gnostic Christianity, mm -hmm. Chaldean documents again, right. Yahweh is a, the, the great serpent. The great serpent. Mm. So it's very, it would be very plausible then for the uh, snake uh, to be in Britain with these people who came from this area in a great migration there and then later came on a great migration to our continent. Well, one of the things that we have in Kentucky is a thing called a dulcimer, which is a harp that uh, like, kind of like a guitar that we strum and lays on the lap. <coughs> Did you have any of those in Britain? There is a record of Welsh instruments, and um, one of them is called a crwy, C R W Y T H, mm -hmm. and it's a box-like guitar uh, that you're mm -hmm. describing, mm -hmm. and it's obviously a, a cousin to, or even closer relative, perhaps a brother or sister to your dulcimer, and uh, may may of course be the same instrument or derived <coughs> therefrom, you know. Uh, I think it would have been similar to an ancient lyre in some ways. Mm. But certainly they had an instrument of that sort, yeah. And of course the harp goes way back to the Chaldean people because... Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, well it's the major Sir Welsh... Leonard it's not generally realized. Anybody sees a harp, they normally say, oh, Ireland, but actually the major Welsh instruments uh, was a harp. Yeah. So well, that one. we found a... Uh, we didn't, but in 1799 soldiers found a... Uh, harp and a mermaid on armor plating mm -hmm. at the mm -hmm. falls of the Ohio and shallow yes, but they, they had some letters on it they thought were Latin mm -hmm. may have been this Colburn but you don't think that's a mermaid no it wouldn't be a mermaid it would be again Yahweh the Yahweh. God uh -huh. e A E A becomes yeah. Yah yeah. becomes Jah becomes uh -huh. Yahweh becomes Jehovah and again it would be the, the Yahweh figure the great uh, serpent with a, a man's upper body and hair on his head and, and the, the either serpent-like, eel-like thing. You know, this certainly tail. got into the early uh, tribes then. And the harp with it would have been the Welsh instrument of brought right to them. Again, the, the, the harp appears to be their earliest and best loved instrument. You know. There's a uh, very strong myth among the Native Americans about a white buffalo and its sacredness. Mm -hmm. And uh, did the uh, did the ancient Chaldeans or the ancient Brits uh, 
have such a type of myth of white? Uh, well, people have researched the sort of bull mythologies back to the first and second dynasties in Egypt, where rows of bulls' heads made of clay with the actual horns of animals mm -hmm. appear around the facades of the supposed tombs of the first and second dynasty and so on. And in Egypt, you've got four bull cults. I think it's the Busiris bull and the Apis bull, oh, sure. and two others. And again, these appear to have been uh, generally white, in, white, in one case white bulls, and you've got the white bull on the Cretan frescoes mm -hmm. in Cretan minor culture. And the bull cults go back again to um, ancient Assyria and beyond Assyria to Chaldea and so on. So the bull cults went all over the ancient world. They lasted as long as Mithras and the Mithras cult, which was very popular, a competitive religion with Christianity, you could say. And uh, yeah, in Britain they had uh, the one surviving relic is that uh, you get mentions of people sleeping on ancient yellowed oxides and having dreams. So it's a big white bull, bull skin, I would think. Mm -hmm. See, asleep. Uh, you get mentions of people sleeping on ancient yellowed oxides and having dreams. So it's a big white bull, bull skin, I would think. Mm -hmm. See, sleeping, and this is very ancient. Are those around today? Well, the point is that uh, in roughly 1070, when William the Conqueror had seized most of England and was moving north, uh, Tancred, I think it's, no, it's Tankerville, I think it's either Tancred, no, I think it's Tankerville, you're the Tankerville, one of his men, up in the Northumberland region near Durham, uh, I think deliberately rather than accidentally, enclosed a large area mm -hmm. with a, a nine foot stone wall. Nine foot? Nine foot. Uh, and this vast area of forest and grazing land enclosed the sacred herd of the British white cattle of the Druids, mm. who were still going strong in West Wales right. and parts of Scotland. And uh, this white herd is known as the Chillingham herd. Mm -hmm. And that herd has remained behind those walls since about 1070, that's 920 years ago. And the descendants of the herd are still there. Can anybody go see them? You can go see them. You have to walk through a little stream and wash your feet before you go in. Um, it's not much advertised, uh, they have to go with a ranger and keep away from them. Nobody has ever laid human hand on them for 900 years. No vet is ever called to treat them. If they are sick, they're sick, they die, they die. If the winters are bad, then the winters are bad, they have to put up with it. No feed is ever put down for them. Nothing is ever taken into the park in the form of animal feed, nothing is taken out. No fertilizer is ever put down, nothing is ever sprayed there. In other words, that herd has to survive as is, untouched by human hand, and still does, and it's still there. Beautiful. And they're wild cattle, you can see they're quite different from the thing you're going to meet in the uh, uh, farmer's field. Yeah. So the druid herd does still exist in Britain, it's called the Chillingham herd. Beautiful cattle. Yeah. And I'm sure that they had uh, mythological importance, religious importance to the druids. And well, and they the must have had it, they must have had it. Yeah. And uh, you've got to realize that Christianity wasn't uh, like 19th and 20th century Christianity in the time of William the Conqueror. That's right. There were all sorts of superstitions and so on. And you had Welsh Gnostic or British Gnostic Christianity still standing firm against uh, Roman Catholicism, which was spreading like a virus across Europe. And you had the contentions that went on into the reign of King John and beyond, mm -hmm. with the you know John marrying a Gnostic Christian in princess in Wales, the Pope saying it's an illegitimate marriage, enraging the Prince of North Wales, who then marries the son of John and the Queen of or Lady of Glamorgan in South Wales, and Joanna is the daughter of John, marries Llewellyn the Great, and all this is illegitimate. You've got Henry the <coughs> uh, having a marriage affair with Nest in South Wales, and the mm -hmm. result is a great man known as Robert the Consul, mm -hmm. who uh, was really the half-brother of Matilda the Queen mm -hmm. uh, of England. And um, again, he's supposed to be illegitimate because he's Gnostic, not Catholic. See, okay. if you're not a Catholic marriage, you're illegit, was the idea. Well, this Gnostic uh, Catholic, or, uh, Christianity reached Britain in uh, 36 uh, AD, mm. uh, then certainly would have been well established in place at the Nicene Council, which was what? Uh, Nicaea. Mm -hmm. Nicaea. To, uh, 324, uh, Then they would have been represented there, is that They right? were. Yeah, mm -hmm. they sent their bishops to the Council of Nicaea. But you've got to remember, Alex, uh, Constantine the Great mm -hmm. goes out of Britain with the British Army around 310 and starts his campaign, uh, backed up by his mother, Helen, who is a British Christian queen. Mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. the father is Constantinus, the Emperor of the West. Yes. And you've got to remember, most of the emperors are British. Mm -hmm. 
And Constantine the Great, being British with his armies, uh, wins battles. He won the famous Battle of the Milvian Bridge and sees Rome and killed off his enemies, Licinius and uh, I think it's Maximianus or whatever. Anyway, he then, uh, having established himself as Emperor of the World, sets up his new capital in Constantinople and he allows the Christian religion to become a legitimate religion in the Empire because he's the British king, his mother's Christian, and he's probably half Christian. Then, of course, he's bombarded with endless successions of contending bishops in the East, mm -hmm. some from Jerusalem, some from uh, Turkey, Anatolia, from mm -hmm. various churches, and from uh, North Africa, and Hippo, and these other people, and, and uh, from Egypt, all with their various brands of Christianity, uh, demanding that other brands of Christianity be snuffed out. Now, most Christianity right through Europe as accepted was not at the time Roman Christianity. All the great German and Gaulish and British people were Aryan Christians. They were totally different. And so Constantine in the end said, oh, for heaven's sake, we've got to settle this. I can't be badgered all my life by these religious fanatics mm -hmm. uh, who were storming into these <coughs> raging about what other bishops were saying. And so he decided we should bureaucratically decide what Christianity should be and establish it and make everybody toe the line. And so you had the first sort of organization of Christianity. And uh, they, they bolted at some stage on whether Jesus the Nazarene was God or what, was not God. And he was elected God by a small majority. Oh. You know, rather like Clinton being elected president of the... Well, well, did the Brits accept that? No, they didn't. And uh, they, they then opted out of any further councils. You, it's very hard to find representation. They just said, that's it, and walked out. Well, then they, the Brits then continued with this Gnostic form of uh, Christianity. Yeah, but the original, they continued with the original Christianity. They seemed to snuff it out in the Mediterranean and put them to death or give them a choice uh, to either... Well, when the Roman Empire fell, I mean, the political power of Rome was uh, shattered. Mm -hmm. It was no more. You had emergent powers in, in Germany and in France, particularly. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously in Spain, uh, Britain was still independently strong. Mm -hmm didn't want to know and the only way Rome could in any way exert influence if it wanted to was to do it through um, they couldn't do it by force of arms but they could do it by the blackmail of threat of religion mm. and saying we've got the keys to heaven and if you don't follow us boy you ain't going to be allowed in and they did that li literally and yeah. the threat, I know nobody's ever seen these keys oh. I know it's in mm -hmm. um, and that was the way it was 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 done was to claim primacy but the first bishop of Rome was Linus who is probably a son of King Caradoc of Britain mm -hmm. Caradoc son of Arch and so how Peter gets into the act is hard to see Peter's not the head of the church uh, in the great councils originally held where there's this dispute between Paul and Peter mm -hmm. the head of the church is James the brother of Jesus who sits as chairman of the council mm -hmm. so the idea of the, uh, everything's handed to him is uh, mm -hmm. Provable fallacy. Mm -hmm. Well, then this this Gnosticism, this uh, church goes on. Gnosticism means knowledge. Knowledge, truth, truth. Yeah, and it goes on for how long? When? Uh, when do you think it? I don't think it ever died. I think it went underground. I uh -huh. think finally, uh, I mean, the Catholic Church actually began infiltrating Britain, and certainly it infiltrated the northwest Bangassi around uh, 800. Mm -hmm. Bishop Elvod was getting himself entangled with the Archbishop of Canterbury. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think the other, the great uh, Archbishopric of England at, at Litchfield was a Catholic. And, and what you've got in England, you've got two coastal Archbishoprics, one in the north at York, on the coast sure. of the immigrant Angles from Germany. You've got one in the south coast, yes. Canterbury, on the tip there, yes. near the channel, for the immigrant Jutes and Saxons. But the British churches, mm -hmm. the archbishoprics are right on the immigrant areas of the coast. The only great archbishopric in England is the one of the central area, Kingdom of Abiragus, who said to have given land to Joseph of Arimathea, St. Illid, and uh, that was an archbishopric but was snuffed out. And again, <coughs> Welsh archbishoprics and, and, and were ignored. If, if the idea of the Pope was that if you didn't receive a pallium from Rome, right, if we didn't set you up <coughs> as an archbishopric right. or a bishop, you're not a bishop. Well, that's rather difficult when you get Britain is Christian in 36 AD and it's a British emperor and king who makes Rome Christian 
mm. in 325 AD, it's hard to see how a bishop of Rome could set up the church in Britain and give them the right to be bishops. The reverse is the case. Yes. And this is the problem. So uh, I don't think we're anywhere near the truth. No. But in 574... And this is the problem. So uh, I don't think we're anywhere near the truth. No. But in 574, would not the king, the monarchy, been Gnostic? Oh, very yeah, heavy. Yeah. The people who would come to America would have been Gnostic. Christians. Very heavy into it. You could call them the Protestants of the day. We, Dr. Ray Hayes, uh, copyrighted in February of this year, the fact that based on Sir Walter Raleigh's because that's a tyranny, it's a monopoly. They're claiming a monopoly on God, and unless you come to us, you can't go to God. Mm. Uh, in other words, um, it's an absurdity. Uh, the British belief appears to have been any man can go direct to God. Um, in other words, you speak to him through prayer or whatever, yeah. through decision. And I, I don't think these ideas would have prevailed. And yeah, finally you had the collapse of, of this in Britain with uh, Henry VIII and the many wives who did it almost inadvertently, but the uh, monks were running around selling uh, holy blood and, and really they were found, and, and they had these little vials that you turned upside down and they changed colour and went red and so on and they filled it up twice a week from goose blood or something like this and duck's blood and uh, uh, there was enough timber pieces of the Holy Cross sold as, you know, religious amulets to make a sizable forest of several million acres, you know, and they were selling pieces of the cross everywhere. And uh, they sold indulgences and penances and pardons, and as you go and commit some heinous crime, and provided you paid enough, the, you got a pardon, duly signed, stamped and sealed in your pardon. Sure. And you could actually buy a pardon or an indulgence to do something mm -hmm. before you committed the crime. Oh, my. In other words, if you paid enough, you were then free to go and do it, and you had your, your, your uh, absolution ready paid. Yeah. So the other thing was that people uh, were threatened with millions of years in purgatory, rotting and roasting in hell, but if you paid the church enough, the priests would go on singing masses yeah. for you for so many years, which would get you out of this purgatory quicker. It's a form of blackmail. One of the interesting things, Alan, the first time that you experienced a Native American ceremony was down in Columbus, mm. Georgia. Mm. And they had a ring with a fire pit with logs and a cross. They had poles out to like north, south, east, and west. And then the Native Americans, all in their fancy costumes, mm. lined up mm. from tall to short. Mm. Give us what you felt when you saw this. Well, they had a circle in the middle with four logs divided, which I felt was the four quarters of earth and four right. quarters of heaven, right. which is a familiar motif right back to Chaldea, mm -hmm. and familiar in the construction of the cosmos as known in Ireland, Wales, Judea, as well, ancient uh, Sumerian lands. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thing was the lining from, uh, not from old to young, but from the tallest to the shortest. Sky. I thought it was the head of a comet streaking around the earth, which again is familiar in Gnostic religion world experience. Sure. Uh, the four poles are uh, the four stars, one in the belt of Orion, one in Taurus, one in Leo, and one in, I think, uh, the Eagle. And if you draw a line from these main stars to each other, they cross and intersect at mm -hmm. the pole star. Mm -hmm. Now if you were to draw that line in the heavens and see that the pole star wasn't at the point of intersection, it oh. means the earth has shifted on its axis and we're in trouble. Right. Possibly through being swished by a comet. And so what they were doing was very familiar to me. I would think and then little he, Albert? Well, little boy came out. Well, there was a man first beating on the drum, and he handed over to little Albert, who was very keen to do it, and he was beating on a drum and shouting in a sort of Gregorian chant, uh, changing his tone and, in, 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 right. you know, and, and going through different uh, octaves. And he was beating a drum and shouting, Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh. In other words, he was shouting Jehovah as they went around. And Jehovah is the great snake, the great serpent, the great comet. So he was shouting Jehovah as oh. this great snake of people in the form of a comet with its long, dwindling tail went round and round the earth. Isn't that funny? That's and it was very simple to see what they do. And if you read the Navajo uh, version of the uh, cosmos and solar mm -hmm. system as they see it in its formation, uh, I've managed to read a, a version of this. Mm -hmm. It's identical to the Druidic uh, version of the cosmos, and this can be demonstrated in Ireland, Wales, Judea, uh, 
and the Chaldean, and perhaps in Egypt. Continuity. Yeah, it certainly fits right in with the legends. One other thing that was found uh, down by Cumberland River was a three-headed urn called a triune <coughs> urn or mm. vessel. Mm. And it was in the home of John D. Clifford in mm. 1820, referenced by Raffinesque mm. and uh, uh, drawn up by uh, uh, another Atwell. Uh, Caleb Atwell actually etched it. But it had three faces going different directions. Mm. And uh, then they found a stone mm. in the up around the Newark, they had three faces on the same stone, mm. and uh, but they they have existed. What do you think that is? Well, it's, uh, clearly you know as well as I do, it exists in the land of cathedral in Cardiff. Yes. Uh, the, the, again, the Catholic Church tried to get rid of all these three faces. I don't. So you've got three faces mm -hmm. on a stone, but the the center face has two eyes and one of those eyes attaches to the outer face mm -hmm. and one of its eyes attaches to the other face and there's four eyes three faces joined together uh you've been exhibiting a little chart and map where these things are from and you find them in in britain spain etruria crete and malta and back to turkey yourself yes. what i noticed when you exhibit these little items that are found with two or three heads joined together mm. you don't talk about the chevrons underneath which are on the front oh, and you should have because the chevrons are a major symbol of the Glamorgan kings, mm -hmm. the Welsh and British kings, mm. kings of Britain, you might say. And uh, the chevrons, as you have said, are exhibited in Genesis with these people carrying their chevrons into battle. Mm -hmm. And yet you still have the chevrons, and you find the chevrons all over the artifacts you're finding in America. Chevrons are all over the artifacts, going from one end of uh, the other, associated with the Godhead. Yeah. Associated with the God. Certainly the king of Glamorgan would have been Arthur. Yes. And so that uh, would be very significant if it's on this continent. Yeah, the trouble with, with Arthur is, again, if you kick out all history before William the Conqueror, mm -hmm. and now the English are having the problem of resurrecting their own Dark Age history, mm -hmm. and they've only just started looking at church charters and cathedral charters of 700 and 800 and so on, and earlier. Uh, the problem is, when you throw out all Dark Age history, inevitably you throw out Arthur the First and Arthur the Second. So whereas in Gibbon's Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire and numerous other manuscripts, documents that he draws upon, mm -hmm. you have a clear description of Arthur I attacking the Roman Empire of the West as chief general of his father, Magnus Maximus Mascambledi. This can't be mentioned, because how can a fictional British king descended from Trojan kings attack Europe in 383? He attacks Europe, he attacks Paris, mm -hmm. seizes the lady St. Genevieve, and yet you've got romance legends of Arthur going into Europe and attacking big cities and seizing Guinevere, it's in mm -hmm. Genevieve. Mm -hmm. You've got the, the well-known histories of Arthur fighting the Roman emperor and killing him. Mm -hmm. Yet this Arthur, Andragathius, the Romans called him, Arthur I, in 383, uh, is confronted finally by Gratian, the Roman emperor, at Soissons. The medievals called it the Battle of Sassi. Mm -hmm. According to the English, the Battle of Sassi. Soissons never occurred. According to the Romans and everybody else in the world, the Battle of Spassons did occur in 383. Gratian is defeated by Arthur, mm -hmm. who's the general for his aging father, Masca, Magnus. Gratian flees with 300 horsemen down to Leons. That's all he's got left. He's in trouble. Arthur goes chasing after him, gets down there. And uh, as you know, they have a, a little bit of a parley and a peace conference, and they decide to have a meal and a banquet together. And uh, in the middle of the banquet, having probably had enough to eat, Arthur gets up, picks up his axe, and cuts Gratian in half. And his father, Magnus, then becomes Emperor of the West. He's already got Britain and France. Spain goes over to him. All of North Africa and Egypt go over to him. Statues are erected. Arthur attacks through Spain, through Switzerland. Uh, there's a, the, the chap that Arthur still there, a pass at near Geneva, St. Genevieve, mm. Geneva, no, Guinevere. And uh, chaff down the Genevieve, mm. Geneva, no, Guinevere. And uh, chaff Arthur means the cad of Arthur, the battle of Arthur. You see, cad is, is a battle. He then goes to Milan, you'll find in Medina Cathedral a nice uh, pre 1100, mm. uh, pre 1100 carving of uh, Arthur and his knights attacking a city, which has to be Paris, you see. And there are names of these knights mm. included, and they all fit. It's Arthur the First, the, the, 
then he goes down to, to Italy, gets to Toronto, there's a, an effigy on a mosaic of him sitting on a goat, Capricorn, you see. But these people are deep into astronomy and astrology, yes, sir. you see. He then crosses into the Balkans. In all Welsh record, he is Arthur, King of Greece. You see, he seizes Greece and the Balkans, and finally Theodosius the Great of Constantinople is forced to gather the armies of the East, and they confront each other in Yugoslavia in two massive battles at Poitovo and Sisika, on Sika River. Arthur returns to Britain and uh, clearly dies, and it can be proved, and his grave exists in Warwickshire in England. Yeah. Huh? So then you have Arthur the Second, a sixth, sixth descent, sixth descendant, uh, generation Generally, descendant, yeah. I can tongue tied here, of Arthur the First, and he mangles the Angles, the Saxons, and the Jews. Is the great king of the Round Table. The main residence of the Glamorgan kings is a place called Keyboard. Keyboard means mutually the mutually together table. It's also got another name, Kaimelin. Kaimelin, the, the yellow fort, and yellow nearby fort. is Yellow Wells Farm, the native of Sulphur yeah. Springs. Go there. So Kaimelin easily became yeah. Carmelin. Mm -hmm. Manuscripts of 1106 say Camelot, Kaim, you know, mm -hmm. is Kaimelin, is in southeast Wales. That's where it ordered. Mm -hmm. If Arthur's a Glamorgan Gwent king, then his fort should be in Glamorgan and Gwent. And the main residence of the Glamorgan Gwent kings mm -hmm. is keyboard, mutually together table, at Kaimelin. Not very far from downtown Cardiff. Yeah, the embarrassing thing for the archaeologists, you see, again, this is where we get the corporate reputation of universities comes into this. Mm. In uh, the 1940s, a young lieutenant, second lieutenant in the Indian Army, visited Mohenjo-daro, where some Mortimer Wheeler is digging up Mohenjo-daro. Sure. In the Indus Valley in mm. Pakistan, it is, not. And, of course, becomes interested in archaeology. Now, he had no qualification in archaeology, mm. none at all. But he goes to Cardiff, got himself a job, and pity he came to Cardiff. There's a 40 other universities he could have gone to in Britain, for God's sake, why didn't he? But while he's there, he gets into the archaeology department. Mm. He's actually got a degree in classics from Oxford, which means a study of Greek and Roman yeah, literature, sure. as I understand it. He's not qualified to do British archaeology, right. and he's no, no, no qualification. This fellow's named Alcock. Yes. Now, Alcock. Uh, then persuades later, he's 19 years there, Cardiff University in Wales to go over into England and dig up Cadbury Hill, which he calls Camelot. Mm. If you look out of the windows of their building, where it is, the top story in Cardiff University, mm. you can see Camelot right. by Mellon. But he goes over to England, and for seven years they dug up this hill. Oh. Now, in his book, you will read on page 163, he says, oh, by the way, everybody knows that in 1536, John Leland, the itinerary geographer mm. for Henry VIII, fabricated and forged and invented all the names from Cadbury Hill, where he lived, in order to make it appear to be Camelot. Oh my. No, it's a well-known forgery. Uh, and there is, he says this in his book. Yeah. So now he is dragging a major university into another country from Wales to England yeah. to dig up a hill that he knows is a forgery. In the index of his book, you won't find Cadbury Hill. You find Cadbury Camelot. Yeah. And he has not one shred of evidence that it's anything to do with Camelot, and not as anybody else. And yet the real Camelot where I stood is, you can look out a building well, I mean, and I mean, I mean, speaking sort of figuratively, uh, they could have stood in their university and thrown, sure. a, thrown a snowball at it. Oh my God. And you see, now you've got the corporate image of the university at stake, because hmm. they're going to look damn fools. But you see, I don't make a fool of a university or of an individual. Uh -huh. They do that themselves. You can only... You make a fool of yourself. When you Nobody can make a fool of you. Do this kind of stuff. And uh, the problem you have with this this type of situation is having put their foot on it up to their neck, because mm -hmm. they went there without any fundamental historical research. If they'd done the historical research, they wouldn't have gone there. But the guy wanted to make a reputation and so on. Mm -hmm. Then he went off to Glasgow University, about 400 miles north, which is a long way in Britain, mm -hmm. and uh, sat there for the rest of his natural. Um, having left them with a gigantic smear on their face, and he shouldn't have been in the archaeology department in the first place. Well, uh, Glastonbury is where they found King Arthur, isn't it? Well, ancient Welsh manuscripts of 920-ish, made for the wedding of Owen, uh, Owen, uh, the son of Howell there, Howell the Good. Howell the Good. 
he's getting married around <coughs> 920, so they traced his pedigree and his wife's pedigree right back to the king. They've got to go back a minimum about a thousand years yeah. to establish something. And they then trace back all the pedigrees of all the other royal families with whom they are connected by marriage in this right. 32 king lists, including the Glamorgan and Gwent king lists, including Tudrig with the Pendragon, Myrig with the Pendragon, and Arthur. It's a whole you see, he's there. But of course you mustn't look at that list. Taboo. But the joke is that this is done in 920, and in the list of kings of the West Midlands, it says what everybody would know if you read the histories, mm -hmm. that Glastons is Breton for, for oaks, Glastons is Cornish for oaks, and Glastenon in Welsh is the scarlet oak tree. It's a palm book. And it says that Glastonbury is at Litchfield. Mm. Now it says it under the entry of a King Mormeo, who is around the year 260 to 300, right AD, through, way right. back. Yeah. Glastonbury is therefore at Litchfield. It means yeah. it's in the central area of England, formerly ruled by the great King Aviragus, yeah. Gwairi. St. George, Gwyrie, yeah. given the Holy Cross by St. Illid, Joseph, because there's no J in the Welsh alphabet. So. Now, that's where it ought to be. It's 220 miles from where they think it is. Oh. Glastonbury in Somerset is not founded until 942 by Edgar, King of the English, who needed a mortuary chapel to get himself buried in. Just like Arthur. Could that not have been a church before that? I would seriously doubt it. It certainly wouldn't have had a damn thing to do with Joseph. Well, the charters Mary. tell you when it's founded, and that's founded... 942. It's yeah. in the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles. Well, Plain and loud and clear. Arthur lived uh, 380s. Well, 380 after the first, and 503 to 579 after the second. So neither one of them could be buried at... Uh, well, they're, a, they're a clear... So what, what they've got is, is they've got a medieval mess-up. St. Dunstan's the first abbot of Glastonbury in Somerset in 943. Mm -hmm. And Edgar gets himself duly buried in his mortuary chapel that he's built and he set up 12 little monks uh, on a bit of an estate there of a, an order which is sworn to poverty mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, that's him buried in 957. If you look at the records you'll find records of the burial of Arthur. Mm -hmm. Significantly they're all in Welsh records. Mm -hmm, the sure. Caradoc of Lancarvan is from South East Wales, it's nine miles from Carvin. Mm -hmm. Lancarvan Abbey is where Arthur in the records meets St. Gildas. Mm -hmm. These are in, I think it's a Welsh family. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Gildas meets Arthur at Lancarvan Abbey, around 970. Mm -hmm. Gildas returns from Ireland. Why is he being on Ireland? He's been in Ireland to get away from the disaster of the comet, right? Got it. Right. Now, uh, the reason of the meeting was that Arthur had cut off the head of one of Gildas' brothers. Oh my. Who caused him problems yeah. and was in rebellion, so he mocked the king and pushed his luck too far and there's a big stone in the town square in Ruthin, it's in by Lloyd's Bank, I think, on the middle, anyway, by a bank, bank is bank. Mm -hmm. and there's a railing around it mm -hmm. and that's the stone where it's been there down the centuries and right down the centuries everybody says that's where he cut off the head of this guy, Hoyle, killed his brother, yeah. chopped his head off on the stone. It's like an execution block. Right. Anyway, where were we? We were with, with this Welsh record. Caradoc of Lancarvan describes the grave of King Arthur. And he gives a number of pointers and he says, it's King Arthur. And he gives a number of pointers and he says, it's uh, near the Great Road. Well, okay. the Great Road runs from London to the old capital. London was the great port, but the capital was Roxeter, Uriconium. Uriconium. Right? Right it's up there in Street. the Shrewsbury area. And it runs up from London to the northwest, yeah. heading for Liverpool, you might say. Mm -hmm. And at the end of it was the capital. Again, you're into the upper midlands of England. Mm -hmm. uh, it says it's Apwyd Wellis, close to Wales. Mm -hmm. It says it's near the Great Scrofum Scrofi, mm -hmm. the Great Scraped Out Ditch, the Great Bank and Ditch running 200 miles yeah. between the Great Fence put up like a Berlin Wall yeah. between Wales and England. You see, by King Offa, mm -hmm. around 800. Uh, it says uh, it's in the, the area of Scrobbers. Well, mm -hmm. it's clearly Shrewsbury in all the records. Again, the county of Shropshire, same area. Same area. It names the tribal people or nations there, the Dibunai mm -hmm. and the Cornubii. Any map of Roman record of Britain locates the Coritani there yeah. and the Juboni. Mm -hmm. Coritani is so north of Birmingham in the Midlands and the west, south of Birmingham, central Midlands, Juboni. It then says there's a place there called Apples. Well, Apples, Applebeat Magna and Applebeat Parva are still there. Still there. 
and you can go on and on and on. It says if you go to where Arthur's grave is, and there is a place called Arthur's Tun, Arthur's Tuin. Well, Arthur's Tuin means Arthur's grave. Home. There was a monastery got rid of anciently uh, by Henry VIII when he got rid of the monasteries in uh, around 1534 to 1536. Uh, it says in Karanik of Lancarven there's a great cemetery there mm. and there are two pyramids near the gate of the cemetery of the monks mm. and in the cemetery are buried multitudes of the great of the British. Mm. And uh, the local council really, <laughs> they took over this vast area and it's shrubland and bushes and trees as wild. Well. And they thought they'd turn it into a walk and a park. Yeah. And as they're doing it, they're finding these huge graves. Oh, no. um, most of them are about 20 feet long, about six, seven feet wide, and perhaps two or three feet high piles of stones. And they are graves. Yeah. Yeah. They're all over the place. There's multitudes of them. Stone grave. Right near the entrance are two big tumulus mounds, mm. exactly as stated, mm. in the record, which should be one for Guinevere and Guinevere. one for Arthur. Mm. Arthur the first. First. See, right where he ought to be. Oh, they both had Guinevere's, didn't they? Well, whether your sure name was Guinevere, I don't know. It, it seems to be fair and, and true and beautiful yeah. one, something yeah. like that, rather than it's, it's titular. Yeah. Most of the British names are titular, Actually. as you know. So you've got a clear record of where he is, and if you follow the directions and don't be misled by this idiotic Glastonbury and Somerset of 942, mm. three, you go straight there. And yeah. there are the two mounds, and there are all the other guys. The place is still called Old Bury. The old cemetery. It is behind what was the monastery, later converted to a mansion house by someone who bought the, uh, the dissolved monastery from the king, and everything is exactly in place. All the names around fit. Ali, you know, uh, Are you, you uh, don't land at the court, uh, Anley, mm -hmm. a place without the court, Battersley Enzo, Slippery Bathing Place of the Court. These names mean nothing in English, but, but they all mean something in Welsh. You have Ra Ratcliffe Cooley, and an Englishman doesn't know what Radcliffe Cooley is, but Radcliffe Cooley, it sounds like a Welsh, means granted free without yeah, taxation. Without tax. And every name in the entire area translates perfectly. It is a place of kings, because there is a, a grave mound there, a vast one, which is recorded as the grave mound of Constantine the Blessed, who was murdered by Vortigern, quite mm. then, King Traherne, yeah. around the 450s. And uh, there's too much evidence to give you yeah. in this sort of talk. But, yeah. uh, you find Arthur the first. Well, then you have about ten records of the burial of Arthur the second, and this greatly distresses the Glastonbury fanatics because one of the records is the Pearl of Oak from Brittany, and it tells how people come from Brittany to visit Arthur's grave. Mm -hmm. Well, the ten hundreds, mm -hmm. and they land on a, a coast of cliffs. Well, that's the Glamorgan coast, if ever I've heard of it. Mm -hmm. It's a coast of thirty miles of cliffs, and there are only certain places you can come ashore. And they get to a little dingle or dell and where they can come ashore and they go up this little valley between the cliffs. And on one side is an ancient church and on the other side is a castle. Well, you can buy all the maps you like of Britain and you can go right round the entire coast. There's only one place where you find mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Only one. And that is Glamorgan at Nash Point, they call it. On the one side is the ancient church. It's called Hen Eglis, ancient church. And there is the grave mound recorded in the Songs of the Graves of King Kerry, who takes over from Karadik to fight the Romans around 50 AD. And it's there, the gravestone. On the other side, you've got the ancient fort. They go northwards, fine, go north, not south. And they come to a wooded long valley, and they go along, and that's the Lantris and Valley. Mm -hmm. and, they, and they come, it's still there, it's still mm -hmm. wooded valley, and you come to the long mountain, and they say, hey, Glastonbury Tor. Is only a pimple little conical hill. It's not a long mountain. No, but money the guy. It's yeah, at Caer Caradoc. And 168 roots of England say Uther Pendragon Arthur is buried at Caer Caradoc. Right? And that's Caer Caradoc. Caer Caradoc. And they get to the bottom of this mountain, the long mountain, and they have to go up alongside a stream. Well, you can go there and the stream still runs down the mountain. Nobody's told it shouldn't be there. <laughs> and it's so steep you have to lead your horse up. You uh, can ride. Yeah. Well, I see people still going up there today to ride ponies and horses round, and they leave their horses up. It's too steep. Mm -hmm. uh, at the top where the stream breaks out, they find the Celtic Hermitage and where Arthur is buried. There, we're in our excavations of 1990, we found a Celtic Hermitage of the period, mm -hmm. a rough mm -hmm. igloo, an igloo-shaped circle of stone building. And the apologists at Glastonbury say, hey, Glastonbury's not a long mountain, the author has got it wrong. And there are no cliffs in this fault and church, you know. They're all wrong. 
And why does the author say the stream is running down the mountain? There's no stream running down Glastonbury Tall. Of course there isn't. And then they say, why do they put the church on top of the hill where everybody knows King Arthur's buried in the Glastonbury Church at the bottom of the hill? Mm. It's all wrong, you know. But there is a well at the bottom of Glastonbury Tall. Mm. They, they will not admit that it's not the right place. So the tack is that the author of the thousand-year-old story is wrong. Not that they have wrong place. That's right. Now, there are ten other records in Welsh manuscripts, the Nennius history written around 800 AD, mm -hmm. the life of St. Ilted, uh, first mm -hmm. cousin of St. King Arthur, and I could go on and on, mm -hmm. the Adushnoi of Taliesin, sixth century documents, and they all tell, we've got ten of them so far, of this strange story of the burial, sure. the boat arriving at the river mouth, the boat, the body in the leather bag, embalmed body, brought to a cave, the cave is still there, you go into the cave, 11 foot long trench cut in granite, 3 foot wide, 3 foot deep and more, not cut for a peasant as I've said, clearly somebody went to a huge labour, then the body is later taken out of that cave grave, taken up to the church at Kai Grada, and it's buried. Just above the church is a grave mound on a hill, still on the maps, always being recorded, Kai Karadok, mm -hmm. the Tuin of Karadok, the king. the king. Just away on the second highest point, mm -hmm. at Kai Karadok, you have Munwell de Milvia, still marked on the maps, Munwell de Milvia. Grave monument of the soldiers, mm -hmm. recorded in all the histories as being built at Kai Karadok, okay. near St. Peter's Church. St. Peter's Church is the church which still stands in ruin below the Tuin of Karadok. At, so everything fits. The people are said to build a huge fire in a field, massive fire the night before Arthur's mm -hmm. buried. Mm -hmm. Kayatan is still there, the field of fire. Field of fire. And you can go on and on and on. It just keeps fitting. And the, the church, 900 and odd feet up a mountain, 10 miles to the sea, is, is called Land Bad Bauer, which means the holy estate of the great ship's boat. Well, he's brought back across the seas in a boat. Mm -hmm. What's it doing? Mm -hmm. And everything goes fitting, 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 till in the end there's no one else to go. We then found that uh, most of the manuscripts translated in the 19th century were deliberately mistranslated. Now, I say deliberately because it cannot be otherwise. Because the mistranslations are so obvious and so childish and so, you know... Why would they do that? Well, it was all part of this, let's get rid of British history before, mm. you know, William the Conqueror, because it's dangerous to the establishment yeah, and yeah, the monarchy. Yeah, yeah. Um, we found, they say, uh, in the Songs of the Graves, which is a massive, doc uh, massive important document, and it's dead accurate. Tells you exactly where the greater and the wonderful had buried. Exactly where the greater and the wonderful had buried. Them, yeah. And typically, you go there, and the grave mounds are there, and the yeah. names are correct. The rivers are correctly named. The mountains and hills are correctly named. Everything's spot on. Yeah. And uh, what you'll find is that uh, it says, uh, you'll find every author writing on Arthur, including the idiots who write on this continent, mm -hmm. who I shan't bother to name, mm. from Nova Scotia and California. Uh, we understand right? who they are. Uh, they say there is one line in the Songs of the Grave applying to Arthur. Well, yeah. the Songs of the Graves is in triplets, three-line verses. Three-line verses. Every king gets a verse of three-line. At least. Or he gets two three-line verses if he's big. big. And if he's very big, he very gets three. Three. Now why, how on earth can you have a one-liner, what happens to the other two lines? You see, it doesn't fit. Especially with Arthur's name in it. Yeah, oh, well, what they've done, they've translated uh, the, the, the first verse as Bay the March, the grave of the knight, as through the grave of a person called Mark. Right. Then it says Bay the Gwaitha, as a person named Gwaitha. These are not names. No nope. It then says, it means grave of the wrathful one. Then the next line they say, uh, Bay the Gugon Gledyplund. It, the er uh, means the, so it can't be a name, right? And it means grave of the angry red sword. Now all these are epithets which are commonly applied to Arthur. Right, the knight, the wrathful one, the yeah. angry red sword. Then underneath it says, an oith be bed Arthur. They've converted the B-Y-T for so be it into B-Y-D, meaning forever. Right. They mangle it. But there was no D. No. They take the an oith which means a bare exposed place, so be it, is the grave of Arthur, and they convert it to Anoith, meaning concealed. So they're able to convert the so be it to forever, and they say concealed forever is the grave of Arthur. It's a, it's a misdirection, you see. Actually, it means a bare exposed place. The next verse then goes on with the description of the grave of Arthur. He's got verse after verse. It starts off with Beth el -Huif. They say the grave of a man named Elquith. Well, this is marvelous stuff because El is extremely and Queef is windy. So it's saying an extremely windy grave, yeah. you see. And it then says a very 
damp, damp. wet place but they convert that to a name and then it says it's a very narrow place but they say that's somebody else they say oh god and then finally it says it's in the field of moist mavedo so you've only got to find a field name and all the field names and every field in wales has got a name and everybody knows the name of every field in the open so we know it's a bad exposed place we know it's extremely windy right we know it's damp and wet probably yeah. a bog and we know that it's called moist and we know it's narrow well, right above this church is a field which is enclosed by a vast boat-shaped ditch and mound, mm -hmm. 200 yards long, yeah. uh, 90 yards wide, yeah. and it's shaped exactly like a ship, oh. Land Bad Bar, the great ship's boat, right alongside the church, north of it. In it, at the steersman's position, where a helmsman would guide the ship, guide the ship. with his oar over the side, sure. is a great mound. Mm. Mm. And it's a very narrow place because there's rising crumbled ground there, very sharp drops this side, mm -hmm. streams and drops run away that side out of the bog, and yeah. two streams run out this mm -hmm. side. It hillocks here, so it's a narrow confined place. Then, it's on top of the mountain, below the mountain you have a plain, you have the seven, you have the Atlantic, and the wind howls in. Mm -hmm. It's terribly windy, it's very wool yeah. exposed, it's very narrow, and it's very damp, it's a bog. It's a bog. And the only dryish place is where the grave mound is. How big is that mound? 100 feet long, 30 feet wide, a couple of feet, a few feet high. It's mm -hmm. been eroded badly over the centuries, I think. So here you have a grave mound precisely described in the songs of the graves exactly where it ought to be. You can prove from what went on there with councils and, and with uh, massacres and so on that Battle. this is Mike Mavetta. You, feel, you know, you can prove it. So we know where he's buried, mm -hmm. and we know where Arthur the First is buried, because the records are dead accurate. And, see, I would find it difficult to see how they would have used a nation living in its territories 3,600 3, years. Why would they lose their great kings and say, hey, we lost him, you know, we lost that one. They know exactly where they all are, because they recorded the fact. It was very important to them. Unless they want... No, the English coming, wandering in from Germany, from the pig forests, and sitting on their backsides in the mud flats of Schleswig Holstein and Holland, they wouldn't know. How could they? And they don't want to know, so they because it be doesn't suit their psyche. It could be very easily misdirected and yet still intact. It's harder to miss Arthur the first and Arthur the second yeah. than it is to find them. Yeah. But you're not going to do it from Nova Scotia and California. Okay. Okay. Transparently quoting what it says in the historical records. That's all we're doing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we're just we're not speculating right. we're not inventing we just say that's what it says mm -hmm. it names the Aweni River it names the cave of Ilti the cave of Ilti is well known it's there if they say Kai Karanok in, in uh, English 168 histories are wrong there's Kai Karanok it's on the damn map today where's the Battle of Baden oh nobody in England can find it nobody in North Scotia can find it you look at the map of Wales, there it is, right in the Muddy State Valley. It's said to be close to the banks of the Severn. It's six miles from the Severn, you can see the Severn, from Hilltop. What's the problem in finding the Muddy Baden, which it says? It's still called Muddy Mountain of Baden. Mm. The road going to it, Bob McCaffrey. You read it, road to the Tumult. You go to that mountain, there's a huge, bare open space. You go to the farmers and the locals and say, oh yes, it was fought up there on those things. They all know. Mm -hmm. They're fathers and mothers and children. And it's called Vice Cad Lower, Field of Battle Area. Mm -hmm. What's the problem? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Then you've got a big field at the top, field of the White Pavilion. And there's trenches mm -hmm. and mounds stuff, like First World War stuff. Because mm -hmm. they used to dig them. Mm -hmm. People haven't realized this. They have a trench in front of them. The mound at the back and it beyond the mound. So the attacking side was a total disadvantage. Hmm. Whoever got there first got his trench. You find these all over Welsh family. And it's hard to see, it's hard to see how you can't find these places. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Isn't it? Yeah. And the Battle of Camline Mountain. But it's Camline. There's no mountain in Cornwall at the Camelford River. Uh -huh where there's a stone which accurately translates into a person named in the Song of the Graves who ain't Arthur. But if you go to Camelon Mountain in Mid Wales, you'll find Camelon Mountain. And you'll find the valley of Camelon, it means crooked plain, and it is. You find the great mounds all over, and you ask the locals, seven years, you know, oh yes, it started up there, it lasted three days, and they moved up the valley fighting this battle. 
But you, you, you read the nonsense of the Jeffrey Ashes of the world and all you'll find is uh, these places can't be traced. You can't trace the Battle of Longbow. Longbow, you find it on the map. There are farms named Longbow on the Cardigan Bay where he fights his way ashore. A great 6th century poem of Geraint is killed at the Battle of Longbow. You go to Longbow, you find the, the well of slaughter, the pool of blood, the field of carnage, and all the names. Mm -hmm. And you say, where's the grave of Geraint? They say, oh, Bed Geraint Farm. Grave of Geraint Farm. You go to the farm, and where's the grave of Geraint? Oh, there it is. The mount. Mm -hmm. And it's still called the grave of Geraint Farm. And you find a stone there, and a fellow named Bledry, son of the minor king, Myri, but David, is killed in the battle. There's a stone with his name on it, Bledry, standing there. So why can't you find the Battle of Longbow when Longbow is on the map at the day? When Arthur comes ashore with his ship. Well basically what you're saying is that well, one, the one, Welsh's history is documented in the English's myths and legends. Well the guy comes from Nova Scotia and says, oh Longbow must be Portsmouth. Uh, oh, brilliant, you know, uh, fantastic stuff. Yeah. You know, really you jumped on that one. Hey? But you can find these places all the time by simply buying a modern, a modern ordnance survey map because all the Welsh names have never changed right down history. And you can find where um, uh, a fellow called Electus was at Moisar Lake, no Basar Lake, and sure. he kills Carl Ka the king, murders him in 296. And so you go on and on and on down these things, and it doesn't matter what period you're in, murders him in 296. And so you go on and on and on down these things, and it doesn't matter what period you're in. They've been looking and still writing books. The English can't find where Carrannock fought the Romans in this big battle of 51 AD. But if you go to Glamorgan history, they'll tell you precisely where it is, and you can go there and see the walls that he threw up and mounds in the ground. But you can't find it because they will not read and will not acknowledge ancient British and Welsh history. Because everything stops with William the Conqueror. And if you have this, it's all forged because Troy never existed, therefore all the history built upon Trojan kings coming through never existed. Never. So in the Songs of the Grave, you've got a, a, a description and a location of the grave of Brutus. But Brutus didn't exist, he's a fiction. So when you go and you see a great massive monster grave right. mount, right. Like that, it does, it's yeah. not there. You see? It's only there because you think it's there. You're hallucinating. That's the problem. There's not the slightest difficulty finding anything to do with Welsh history, or British Welsh history. Dolly. The only problem is that you've got a massive written record which is inadmissible evidence. And, Your Honour, this evidence cannot be permitted and not exhibited in court because it ruins our case. So please disallow this evidence because the man who produces this evidence didn't have a warrant to do it from us. Yeah. Right? Beautiful. So this is it in a nutshell. Yeah. It, it, it's as plain as a pipe stamp when you get out of inadmissible evidence. So they can rule out anything that doesn't suit them. And then they say, there's no history, it's a great mystery. Well, they created it. Does this make sense to you? Yeah, it certainly does. That's why I, I, just, I didn't want to try to tell the terms. Newton might be, I don't think so. Bennett can be. There's English token. Edmund English is often a Welsh name, right? A man, you know, yeah. a man who's or Edmund England. Yeah. Because he's a guy that's been into England or speaks English, yeah. so they call him from uh, Tom England. Tom England. Tom, he, no, he's not from England. He's a Welshman. No, Welsh. but he's been there, so been he's there. been from there. Well, he's no Hamilton. Uh -huh. Butler could be Norman. Butlers are around South Wales and yeah. Normans. Yeah. Butlers of the, you know, the kings, literally. Ellis, possible. Sutton, West Wales. Little England beyond Wales. Jones, again. So there's possibilities, yes. Far possible. These are the names of the lost. Johnson, Stamp, that is Lucas. I think you're in business. Archer, Wright, Dutton, Allen, Waters, Richard, Arthur. Mm. Uh, Catlin, Clement, possibility. Uh, well, Wooden, uh, Midlands, Borden, Thomas Scott, Little, Wiles, Martin, Patson. Darcy Cherry, Hewitt, Bird, Bishop Brown, Tompkins, Doll, Payne, Nichols, Nichols, Possibility, 
Harris again, the possibility. Women. Dare Harvey Wood Powell, Winifred Powell. Woohoo. Mm. Archer, Jane Jones. Woohoo. Jane Pierce. <laughs> Chapman. Mary Moth. Don't know what that's supposed to be. Sounds like Meredith, doesn't it? Coleman Lawrence, one in Mannering, Payne Vickers. Boys and Children, Sir John Sampson. There's Robert Ellis, yes. Vickers. We're ready. Thomas Humphrey, yes. Thomas Smith, how Pratt, Vickers, children. Yeah, you've got a, enough possibilities for there to be definitely somebody who could... Who could understand well. Yeah. yeah. Seven, several possibilities of people who could have a relative, uh, yeah. a basic understanding, yeah. uh, an origin ready, of we grandparents. Honor her. Mm. Right. So I would say I yes is a possibility that some of these people would, if confronted with a speaker, have known enough from their parents or grandparents or themselves to have muddled through as well. Just area, which, if we find out where it is on the map, see what I'm trying to say, it's going to be in a certain geographic context. The Irish, the Irish had their religious centres in a certain geographic context of their country. Mm -hmm. So I thank you. If you go to Ireland or read the Irish histories, they'll talk about the five counties, right? But actually what they've got is four counties, like that. And they've got Ulster, they've got Connaught, they've got Munster, and Lent Leinster, right? But they talk about the five, because in the middle here, you have meat. Now each of these counties has a representation, okay? The temples of Ireland, of ancient Ireland, are in meat. It's like a Switzerland, a neutral area. Nobody fights our wars there. It's the holy area. The same thing happens in Wales. You've got Gwynedd, Powys, David, and Morgannon, right? Mm -hmm. And in the middle you've got Gwrthairn the place of the monarch of men, Gwrthania. So you've got four areas, but they call it always five. Now in the Irish record, this area in the northwest is always Ulster soldiers in the, re in the legends and histories. This area, north northwest, northeast soldiers, northwest is always magic, wizards, uh, uh, religion. The south west is always farmers and yeomen and the southeast is always the government control organization in wales powys is always soldiers warriors stories than that huh? the northwest gwynedd is always magic religion and so on and the southwest northwest southwest david is always farmers and yeomen and so on and the southeast, where the Arthurian kings were actually, is always government, kings, rulers. So this is the organization of the state. Now you can trace that right back through uh, the whole of England. is split up into the same fours, North England, Middle England, Scotland. The organization of the state, the holy areas. You've got one in the north of England, in uh, Elmet. is surrounded by the four of, of Bernicia, Deiria, Strathclyde and, and Brighton. There's the same four situation in the south, centred on Oxford, and there's the same four in Scotland to the centre. If you go back into Judea, you find the same arrangement, and if you go back into Chaldea, Sumer and Akkad, you find the same four arrangement of the... Actually, it's like that. It's soldiers, magic, religion, yeomen, farmers, the government. And you find it in Judea and in Israel. No. And in Egypt. No, the, the trick is that each of these had temples, and there were some others. And the temples had a layout. Once you know the layout of the temples, you only got to find one or two, and you can find all the others. You find the religious zone. Once you find the religious zone, you can map, you can say, well, there's one here, one there, one there, so there ought to be one there and one there, like that. And you find the others then, automatically. Now they're well known where they are in Ireland, and we know exactly where they are in the UK. And they're there. If these people came here from Wales, they would have set up the same type 
organization and somewhere there must be the religious zone and you may well have hit smack on it because in the religious zone you're going to find the burials and the graves and the religious centers and what have you. That's why the map is so important. That's why drawing a map of where these ports were and where they went and the boundaries of their territories is utterly important because I can find where the religious zone is the minute I find that I'll find where the graves are and you know where the graves are. The law makes sense to you? Yes. Yeah. Yes. How nice. Well, pop over in that chair and let's leave it here. Uh, nip in here in a second. Yeah. Take him here. Alan, uh, <coughs> back when Sir Walter Raleigh brought a uh, colony to this country over on Roanoke Island in, in uh, off the Virginia coast, came over in the late 1500s, established a colony, went back to England, was to come off the Virginia coast, came over in the late 1500s, established a colony, went back to England, was to come back one year later, and of course they got in the middle of the Spanish Armada and were not able to return. When they finally were able to come back, some, I think it was three years later, they, they found on the island uh, the fort that they had, an earth, earthen fort, and it was uh, totally deserted. Carved on one of the trees was the word C-R-O-A-T-O-A-N, Croatoan or some such pronunciation. Uh, when Joey and I were over in North Carolina, south of there, uh, digging around uh, in Robertson County, we, dis we discovered over there that there was a legend floating around and they connected it to the first baby born in that colony, Virginia Dare. No one knew what happened to her. But there's a legend over with among the Indians that there was a white deer and uh, that there was this woman and some of the locals connected it with maybe Virginia Dare had grown up and she had become this goddess of the forest or, or mm. whatever but mm. there was the legend of the white deer is there anything uh, that you know comparable to that in uh, in wales there's all a uh, legend of white deer connected with women in that sense that i can you know, tell you about uh, what i i can tell you is that right through the lives of the saints and i mean most of the, the saints there are incidents concerning deer often white deer usually they're stags and the normal format, uh, one of the normal formats, is that the, the stag or deer is being hunted by the huntsman. And it runs to the saint and usually flops down exhausted and lies on his cloak and therefore is totally protected. In some instances the, the huntsman, usually a prince or king, comes up and has to then pay the saint uh, money to or grant him land to build a church because this is immediately a holy place. Now, the deer appears to be the sign of divine providence and white animals are definitely uh, absolutely divine in, in this sense. Um, immediately you have the life of Saint Adosius, the life of Saint uh, Ducco, the life of Saint uh, Duffling, the life of Saint Ilke and Tylo and I don't know about the life of Saint David, certainly the life of Carrick and most of the, the other saints where their lives are written you do have these incidents with stags or deer and uh, white. The second thing is that uh, when King Tudric, Uther Pendragon, the grandfather of Arthur II, is killed, severely wounded, mortally wounded, about to die and dies after the Battle of Tinter and Dindale, a ford on the river Wife, in 508, uh, he's taken away on a cart, and the cart is drawn by two deer, two stags, and the laps use stags and deer to draw carts anyway. And uh, one version also is that, that uh, stag's antlers are placed on either end of the, of the car. And so it would appear that uh, stags play a, a part in this and are usually the symbol of divine providence. Uh, so, you know, stags do constantly reoccur and it's one of the revered animals in the sort of poem about the history of the world. If you read the Bible, you've got the history of the ages of the world in Genesis and mm -hmm. the stag comes into that. Mm -hmm. So the stag is a, is a much revered animal, divine providence. As regards white animals, uh, if you read the Mabinogi, the first four branches of the Mabinogi, uh, the Genesis tale, huh? 
which appear to match closely with the seven tablets of creation from Babylon, and in short, they all took the same people, you'll find that a, a woman uh, arrives with a pack of hounds, and she is white on a white horse with white hounds, and she appears in the sky and is racing across the sky. So the idea of white animals and white things is very much uh, in vogue to do with religion. I've already told you about the Gillingham herd, of, mm -hmm. uh, Gillingham herd of uh, white cattle. Mm -hmm. So white is important, stags are important, and inevitably connected with divine providence. Mm -hmm. Quite what they may be on that, but I've not researched it. I mean, I, I know of it, you have come across it. It's mm -hmm. not something that's not So it would be a Welsh idea, yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, we've, uh, while we've got you sitting here, uh, you've just had a, uh, had a look at a uh, couple of uh, sites on one mm. farm up in eastern mm. Kentucky, mm. The, the Spratt sites. Mm. Uh, any reaction to those? Uh, yes. Uh, well, my reaction, as you well know, is, is that it's a religious site. It's concerned with Yahweh or Jehovah. It's uh, not only a religious site, it appears, I would think, to be a burial area where the great and the good and probably others were brought by the buried or cremated. There is uh, what I would call literature, inscriptions on the walls, certain areas around it, and therefore it's of very great importance. Mm -hmm. And it should tell us something about the area yeah. and about what was going on. The snake uh, sign there, which is Jehovah's sign, the great God, you know, Yahweh. Uh, it's in the ground, and therefore you have a Christian center. It might seem odd to have a snake in a Christian center, but that's mm -hmm. the way it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you've got a Christian center, it's a highly religious area, um, and it has to be a, a very, very important site. Mm -hmm. And could you could you recognize any of the inscriptions? I could recognize, uh, well, everything I saw appeared to me, appeared to me to be called an inscription. Mm -hmm. So I think they could be read. Okay. I don't know if that's uh, any help. Uh, you, you've got a cross in some cases with a, a, an angle that way, which is an E and an Ecrois. And you've got a cross with an angle in the other way, which could be Cruis and be Cruiba, meaning the end. And, you know, uh, but those are sort of a hieroglyphic, rather, almost hieroglyphic rather than cauldron, but they do occur. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, no. But the rest of it is pure cauldron alphabet, which of course can be read. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you very much. Pleasure.